Hey, it's me, Vicky Marie. Thank you for being here with me. Please don't forget to subscribe if you're not already subscribed and leave your fingerprint on the like button. Okay, let's get straight into this video. We're talking about Riley Strain. We're talking about Riley Strain, the young boy, 21 year old boy, got a bit worse for wear as 21 year old boys do and had to leave a bar in Nashville, Tennessee, where he was with his friends. Disappeared completely. Uh, there is CCTV footage of him. Unfortunately, the road he was walking down is right beside a river. And uh, Riley disappeared and for two weeks, no trace was found of him, except uh, two TikTokers found his debit card on the bank of the river unfortunately then he was found by a worker not by the searchers you know as so often happens everybody had been searching for riley you know there was a lot of um, different organizations of course the police but other organizations out searching for riley in the river he was not found he was found by a worker who removed something else from the river and Riley unfortunately was there under a log apparently I mean we don't know exactly um, but there was Riley and poor Riley who seems to all intents and purposes have been such a lovely lovely young man uh, was deceased and um, was only wearing his shirt his boxers his socks and his Apple Watch. So disappeared were his jeans, his wallet, which probably had been in the jeans, and his cowboy boots, which were size 15. Riley was a very tall guy. He was six foot five, similar height to my son. Uh, he was a very slender guy. Uh, we're going to see lots of pictures of Riley anyway. Now, I just want to say uh, that the reason that I'm carrying on with this bit, because the police have said no suspicious circumstances. We've heard that so many times, and it could be that there are no suspicious circumstances. But Riley's family are taking it further. Now, they're not saying that there are suspicious circumstances either. What they're saying is there is enough um questions that they need answering uh, that before they will accept that there are no suspicious circumstances. So I want to make it clear they're not saying definitely the suspicious circumstances. What they're saying are there are questions that they want to be answered. Now, oh, one thing I just want to say is I am wearing green because uh, green was Riley's favourite colour apparently, and everyone wore it at his celebration of life that was held on Friday. Now, I don't think it was an actual funeral. I think it was a celebration of life, a ceremony. Um, Riley's body now is with his parents. So at least they've had, you know, the comfort, the cold comfort of bringing their son home and eventually... Uh, if not, or I'm not sure if he's actually been buried or uh, cremated already or whether it was just a service that they held. But they're intending to hold a second post-mortem, a private post-mortem, uh, because the other thing that was strange about Riley's um, post-mortem was that he had no water in his lungs. So this can happen with dry drowning. Uh, so it still doesn't necessarily mean um, there was false uh, um, foul play involved. Could have been a case of dry drowning, which can quite often happen, apparently, when someone is intoxicated or if they've had traumatic uh, injuries. But there were no evidence of traumatic injuries, apparently. So, you know, basically, there's more questions than answers at the moment. And that's why the family are continuing in their investigations, along asking for help, you know, uh, from anyone, from internet, um, TikTok, they're conscious that the only real lead that they ever had uh, while Riley was missing was 
the debit card that was found by the two TikTokers. And they appreciate that. They appreciate everyone who reaches out to them. They are very, very gracious in sharing their grief as well, which we'll see in this video, sharing some personal videos of Riley and of the celebration of life, etc. So that's why I'm wearing green, because apparently uh, it's not my favourite. This is the only thing I own in green, um, but it was Riley's favourite colour. So uh, that's why I'm wearing green for this video. Now, I want to start with a video that I showed earlier. Uh, this is a video that was on, put on Facebook by the friend of the family, Chris, um, who is, you know, regularly posting in Facebook groups, etc. Um, with memories of Riley or asking for help. And he posted on April Fool's Day, because apparently Riley had a very good sense of humour. Uh, and he was saying that normally on April Fool's Day, he would be in touch with Riley, would send him some sort of a video, etc. Anyway, as a mark of respect to Riley, he um, put this video on Facebook to hopefully make everybody laugh. Made me cry, but I can see why it would make people laugh as well. It's lovely to see Riley so happy, laughing, etc. You know, it's so, so nice. And what Chris Dingman had said, I'm sharing this today because being April the 1st and April Fool's Day, I would have sent Riley something to crack him up and he would have laughed and reached out and we would catch up on Life Girls School. I'm sharing this today so the new incredible family that Riley Strain has gained seem to be able to be getting through this without tears this time. I'm afraid I got a bit emotional this morning, uh, which is not right because... Um, I mean, I do feel this empathy, uh, but it's, it's not, I, I should be able to get through a video, you know, just presenting the evidence. Anyway, never mind. Uh, so the new incredible family that Riley Strain has gained can see the funny side of the boys. So this is uh, Chris Dingman's son. This is Riley on the left, which you'll see him fully in a moment when I uh, put the uh, picture on full picture. Um, and here is infectious laugh and giggles. So enjoy, keep his family in your prayers. They're doing better, but still need them. Without further ado, I present to you the Beavis and Butthead, aka Riley and B, the Dingman family, VACA edition. Feel free to share also to make someone else smile and laugh today because Riley would have loved that. I mean, oh, it's so beautiful. Those words are so beautiful. Okay, so let's have a look at this video. Just, I think also it's important that we see Riley as a person, not just a case, not just, you know, someone miles away in Nashville uh, or, you know, uh, Springfield, which is where he's from. He's a real person. Uh, it's lovely to see him laughing and smiling because, you know, he did have happy times and that's all we can hope for in life really, isn't it? But um, I think this, this Riley case has affected uh, so many of us because at the end of the day, people do, or sadly, people do go missing every day and people do fall into rivers and things do happen. And But I think with Riley, because of the CCTV of him sort of bit worse for wear from drinking or taking something or whatever, or maybe he'd been spiked, and this is, the toxicology report has not come out yet, so we don't know the answer to that yet. But to see him um, like that was very, uh, you know, that must have been so difficult for his parents because you could tell, you know, he fell over, he banged into things, he, he seemed to be just, he didn't know where he was or what he was doing. And you just feel like you wish you could just reach into that video, pluck him out of there, hold him you know hold him safe uh because just shortly after that uh he was unfortunately deceased now i think why this resonates with so many of us is for various reasons i know exactly why it resonates for me i mean apart from the fact when i was young 
I, that could have been me easily because I used to go out and get, you know, drunk as young people do. And I think I'm very lucky that nothing, no harm ever befell me because there were times when I don't think I could have protected myself, etc. But I think more so that this feels resonates with me is, you know, I have a son who now is past this age of the um, going out to clubs, etc. He's not really. It becomes less important as you get older. I mean, he's still only young. He's only 27. But, um, you know, this is the pro sort of you get that thing of roundabout when you're 18. It's exciting, isn't it, to go to clubs to get in, you know, to, um, you know, lie about your age and things. Or that's how it was when I was young. Of course, in America, I think you've got to be 21 to legally drink. So Riley was only just at that age. So that probably would have been a very exciting time going out with his mates. You know, he, he was just finishing university. He was just on the brink of his career and they were out celebrating. And I think that's why it resonates so much with me because there's been many times, you know, my son has gone off into town with his mates, you know, and they always have a, what they call in Spain a bote on where they all have a drink before they go in the club so they don't have to spend any money when they get in there, you know, because uh, young people are always trying to save money, aren't they? Um, and, yeah, and he has been, um, you know, wandering around town, sort of, look, he's been lucky. Uh, he got a lift home once from a friend who saw him there. He was on his motorbike. He got on the back of his motorbike and brought him home. Normally, he would ring me. Normally, it was, Mom, can you come and get me? You know, because here in Spain, of course, they go out. They don't go out till 11 o'clock. Well, you can imagine I'm going to bed then. Uh, and then they're normally out till 6 in the morning. Uh, but quite often, my son, because he had, you know, anxiety issues, probably like a lot of people sometimes he would just you know stay because that would be okay for me to if I could get five I would get up at six anyway so that was a good time for me to go and pick him up uh but sometimes he'd want to come home early and at the worst time was if it was like about two so you've you've sort of fallen asleep and you're in a deep sleep and the next minute the phone's going can you come and pick me up I want to come home you know like Right, right, because there's no all-night buses here. You'd have to walk, and it's a long walk. Um, and I'm sure quite a lot of his friends have done it because their parents won't be stupid enough to go and pick him up at 3 o'clock in the morning. But no, not me. Uh, I, I would always go and pick him up um, because I just didn't like the thought of him being there vulnerable. So, of course, then they get to a certain age when they live away from home, then, of course, you're not there to control that. Uh, it's very sad. His parents, you know, they just must be devastated. I cannot even imagine how this feels for his parents. Anyway, let's have a look at this video and happier times for Riley. I think it will make you smile. It's lovely to see his little face and the other boys. You know, they just look so sort of happy and carefree. And that's how it should be, isn't it, when you're young? <laughs> Ah, ah, I funny to see what young boys, you know, find funny just like nothing, but even you know, you know, men never really grow up, do they? So even Chris, they, they find it funny as well. So, uh, but it is, it's lovely to see them all laughing together. Hello, I understand you want to be like the fake corn holio. <laughs> <laughs> you must first find TP for my bun hole. <laughs> so typical vacation with the Dingmans, we miss you big boy. So that's the other reason, I think, why I feel this affinity uh, with Riley as well is because of his height, because my son is the same height and, you know, Riley having these size 15 cowboy boots that have gone missing. Uh, if my son was there, he'd be the prime suspect because they would. that's his size as well. And there's not many people have that size of cowboy boots. 
it does make you wonder, you know, if someone's, gosh, you know, if they're looking for a suspect, they just need to look for someone with cowboy boots on that too big because there won't be many people who are size 15. Um, and the jeans will be long, you know, so anybody who's an average height or even, you know, normal sort of tall size, like six foot, if they're jeans for a, uh, someone who's six foot five, you know, they're going to need some taking up, aren't they? Uh, so that's the other reason why it resonates with me. It reminds me of my son a lot, but, um, you know, uh, maybe that's part of it. But I think also just the natural empathy that we feel for any young person uh, and their family that have lost them, it's uh, very tragic. So I wanted to show you that first. Now, I've got a list of things. Uh, ah, so the second thing I wanted to show you was, as I said, last um, last Friday, Easter Friday, was the celebration of life that was held in Riley's hometown. Uh, and everyone was asked to wear green, which is Riley's favourite colour. And we're going to have a little, uh, we're just going to sort of look at something about that. So, first thing we're going to look at, this is a video talking about it. And then we are actually going to look at the video of the celebration of life because um, Riley's, the friend of Riley's family uh, and or Riley's family have put it on the Facebook channel because they wanted people to have an opportunity to see it. They're really sort of so welcome. You know, they really appreciate the help that people have tried to sort of spread this story around attract attention to it um help in some way look at the cctv offer you know um answers that they don't feel like they're getting from the police because the police have more or less stonewalled it all and said there is no investigation because this is not suspicious circumstances and uh, Riley's family are not necessarily happy with that. So this is just a video talking about it on one of the news channels. Family and friends of a Springfield man gathered for a celebration of the Kickapoo grad's life. Riley Strain's death made national headlines when he went missing in Nashville after a night out. Search crews found his body two weeks later in the Cumberland River. Michael Hoffman joins us live at Green Lawn Funeral Home East with details from that memorial service. Michael. Well, Paul, it's a story that's touched the heart of the nation. Hundreds of people gathered here earlier today, all wearing green, Riley's favorite color, all to celebrate the life of a young man taken too soon. We know that he'll be with us forever, but it's devastating. A packed house for Riley Strain's celebration of life in his hometown of Springfield. Lifelong friends of Riley took the podium to share their heartbreak. Riley was my friend, my teammate, my day one, and most importantly, my family. I still can't fathom that he's not next to me as I stand here today. Oh. I want you to know how much I love you and will always be thinking of you. And I will strive to be the man you were. And I hope you make me, and I hope I make you proud. Hundreds made the trip from far and wide. Riley's mom is even getting support from her employer. They made the trip from Arizona to be with the family. They had a very special relationship. You could tell that. She always spoke about him. I understand they spoke multiple times a day, every day, even when he was up in Columbia at Mizzou. So I uh, just felt it was important to come and, and support the family. And uh, I know he was a fine young man with a very bright future. Those who aided in the search, like John Blevins and his search oh. dog, Malice, also felt like they needed to come. Oh, even the dog went. Oh, you know, we love a dog, don't we? Look at that lovely dog. So they helped in the search. Oh, what a beautiful dog. Very somber. Very, very somber. Uh, you know, so unexpected. And uh, him being such a model child and a buddy to all his frat brothers and all that, you know, two months from graduation from uh, an accredited university and uh you know a... you know i was saying earlier in the video that i put out earlier often when uh people 
uh, a loss to this world, especially young people. We always talk about, oh, heaven has another angel, etc. And, you know, but Riley does just feel like that there's a goodness that shines out of Riley you know like quite often we talk about uh when we're talking about twonks or the eyes you know the eyes are the windows to the soul and you can see Riley's face his eyes is so open he, he's you can see the the goodness in his soul um so it's even especially sad isn't it because he was so he is a loss to the world i know we perhaps say that quite often but genuinely it really was he is a loss to the world brilliant future ahead of him and then all of a sudden he's gone those who went to give their respects wore green clothing riley's favorite color bailey summers a lifelong family friend of the string family says while it is difficult it's humbling you know and this is how we feel and god knows how his family feels i hope it gives him a comfort of some kind knowing how you know because you do feel uh other people's love even people you don't know and i think i've talked about that my dad's funeral was the same people turned up like you know that i didn't either didn't know or hadn't seen for ages even the windy cleaner the you know sometimes and that gives you a comfort later on when you think of all those people that came to pay their respects all those people that shared your uh, grief and sort of sent you prayers and goodwill and it does help it doesn't help you know ultimately his parents his friends his family they've lost a very special person you never recover from that you never recover from it but as years go by these kind of things that are a comfort you know that people shared in your grief that people uh, genuinely cared about riley does count for something to see how many came together to celebrate riley's life i think we've all tried to see the silver lining and see the good um mainly because that's what riley would do through anything oh. he would always find something good oh. and um, well, that just shows you so it sounds like he was an inspirational guy who would always find something good you know so it's lovely was mentioned in the service that this too shall pass and that's something that his mother and him would say several times. And so um, we're trying to find the good just as Riley would and everything. You know, Paul, one thing that was on everyone's mind here early today is not to take your family for granted. And as Riley's mom said in Nashville, hold your babies tight tonight. For KY3, Michael Hoffman. Yeah, definitely take the advice and hold your babies tight tonight. This afternoon, family and friends of a Springfield man gathered. Okay, so the next thing I want to show you is the actual footage that's on uh, Facebook, not all of it. Uh, the, the celebration of life service, it's quite a long service. We're going to look at about 10, 15 minutes of it, the beginning of it. Uh, to give you an idea, but, you know, I'll try and remember to put the link in the description box of the whole thing if you want to watch the whole thing also it's got music on it and uh the problem with that as far as youtube's concerned uh you know what they're like they can shut things down because they don't like the copyright etc okay so let's so we're gonna go up to 15 minutes we're gonna watch 15 minutes we just ask that you stay and bless the service. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Welcome. My name is Sherry Adams, and I'm honored to be here today as a life tribute celebrant for Greenlawn Funeral Homes. I've had the privilege and the pleasure to sit down and talk to Riley's parents, Chris, Michelle, Ryan, and Millie, and they've shared some amazing stories about his life and some precious memories. And today, we're gonna to share a lot of those with you as well. We can laugh and cry together and just be thankful how Riley's vibrant spirit and loving nature touched so many lives. On behalf of the family, we say thank you for taking the time to be here today. I know they've been overwhelmed yeah, and the other thing uh, I just want to say, oh, look at his picture there. You know, that won't have been an easy thing to prepare. I mean, funerals or celebrations of life, 
you know, even for someone who's older and been ill or, you know, something you're expecting, they're difficult, aren't they? You know, or somebody who dies suddenly, but they're older or they've got existing health conditions and stuff. But for a 21-year-old boy, you know, your 21-year-old son, you would never think you're going to have to stand there and... Um, sorry, I'm getting upset now, that you'd have to stand there or you'd have to plan a celebration of life for your 21-year-old. Um, and, you know, I think in some ways, there's other ways that you can lose your children, of course. Uh, and, of, uh, you know, there's accidents, car accidents. Uh, Self-deletion, of course, is common in young boys and mental health issues. Uh, are so common that many people lose their children in that way. That's terrible as well. Uh, and this, as a, a, an accident, it seems, or was it? You know, and the thing is, the this poor family, they've got so many questions. They need the answers. They need the answers, and we are going to do what we can to help them find the answers. Maybe our little contribution won't be much. Maybe that, you know, but uh, we're going to help. As far as my channel, when I say we, I mean us, my channel, the computer, our community, we're going to help uh, as much as we can. Now that I know that that's what they want, because I was being a bit reticent about it, because, you know, I don't want to make, if the family don't want you to help, like in some cases, uh, then, yeah. You know, you can't really, because, you, you know, you have to respect the wishes of the people close to them. Uh, and not only partners, but, you know, parents especially, I think. You know, you do have to take all this into account. So, we, you know, the family want help. They want answers to their questions. And we are going to try our best to help. With such an outpouring of support, love, and friendship, we also are going to welcome those who are able to join us today via live stream. Riley often quipped, green makes you look good. So in that spirit, we say thank you for taking the time to wear your green today to honor Ryan's love, Riley's love of life. In this time of grief, let us not mourn his loss, but instead celebrate his incredible life. Riley cherished the relationship he had with each and every one of you. He is a loving son, grandson, brother, nephew, cousin, and dear friend. He was personable, caring, kind, and never met a stranger. He was wise before his years, honest, polite, respectful, and genuine. That list could go on and on. You know, I know people don't like to speak ill of the dead obviously no one's going to stand up at a, a celebration of life and say they're a horrible person or whatever but you really do feel with these things that this this is true you know all of it is true that Riley was a very very special person with a very open manner and you know sometimes that can be dangerous in this world sometimes you can be too trusting too nice you know that could have been something that led to if it you know, if there was some foul play, uh, you know, apart from the fact of his state, you know, he obviously was in some sort of either inebriated state or uh, some substance abuse, which, as I say, could well be spiking. I'm not saying that Riley had taken anything. The toxicology will show what was in his bloodstream. And then it would be a question of, well, did he take it or did somebody give it him? Um, but, yeah, do we really feel with Riley, uh, don't you, that he genuinely was a really, really nice guy? Now, uh, the other thing I wanted to say is, with the nowadays, one good thing about Zoom and live streams, etc., because when there is, like, for example, a celebration of life like this, which is a private thing, uh, though they wanted people to go along, uh, I expect they'll have maybe a private ceremony at another point, you know. But it's good that people can share it with it. Instead of turning up, then that could be quite.
quite overwhelming, couldn't it, for uh, people? You know, for the family and everything, if like, you know, a thousand strangers turned up from all over the world or whatever, that's not good. But it's so nice that people can watch watch it through live stream and feel a part of it without being intrusive. Uh, so that's, you know, something positive about the world we live in today. And I think it's been so nice of the family and so appreciate, appreciative of them to let us share in this private moment. Riley embraced outdoor adventures, whether it was hunting, fishing, or simply enjoying the serenity of the lake. Riley's competitive spirit shown through in his tennis matches and his budding interest in the last few months in the discipline of jitsu. Above all, Riley cherished his time spent with his family, creating lasting memories. He loved his family passionately, unconditionally and beyond measure. He leaves in the legacy of love and family. In Psalms 96, 11, 12, it says, let the heavens rejoice, let the earth be glad, let the sea resound and all that is in it. Let the fields be jubilant and everything in them, let all of the trees of the forest sing for joy. Riley was given the gift to love all animals as much as humans, and he was a budding and great conservationist. Oh, so he was um, a lover of animals. Now, it says he was 22. I thought he was 21. Maybe his birthday has passed since he went missing. But anyway, it doesn't matter really as far as anything's concerned. But he was 22 years old. Okay, bless him. Now, you know, he's exactly the same age then as the twonk who's been arrested for the murder of Samantha Murphy. Now, we must remember he's not been convicted of that yet. He has been arrested, charged. See the difference between these two boys? You know, one is, there's one boy, same age. Looked like he had similar sort of upbringing in a way, you know, where anything you see, I mean, we don't know what goes on behind closed doors of course, but seems like he had, you know, a good upbringing. Uh, no reason to think he didn't have a good upbringing. Look at the way he went. And then we look at Riley and why is Riley the one who ended up in the river? You know, it's uh, sometimes uh, life seems very unfair, doesn't it? It does seem unfair sometimes. Riley was 22 years old. He was born on Wednesday, January 2nd, 2002, here in Springfield. He passed away too soon on Friday, March 22nd in Nashville, Tennessee. Today we're grateful as we know. So he just had his 22nd birthday in January. Riley is sitting in his heavenly home. Today we come to stand with his dear family, his devoted parents, Michelle and Chris Whited, Ryan and Millie Gilbert, his two siblings, Brooke Dunbar, and Brock Hell, his grandparents, Rosalie Strain, Wayne and Eileen White did, Deborah Gilbert, Robert and AJ Gilbert, and Clarence and Rosie Graves. Riley also leaves behind an extended family of aunts and uncles and cousins whom he loved very much and was always very close to. He was also close to his 10 year old cousin Henley his cousins Jake and Chelsea, and he adored his two-year-old second cousin, Cooper. We trust that he's been... So he's got this uh, massive um, extended family. You know, he seemed to be very close with his family. Of course, the guy who's representing the family at the moment, I think is the godfather, the video that we saw uh, with Chris's son and Riley in the back of the car. I think he's Riley's godfather and reunited with his grandfather, Floyd Ray Strain. Riley's warm heart extended to a beloved trio of pets, Miles, the golden doodle, Cooper, the red healer, and the German shepherds, Vicka and Vin. They brought Riley great joy and companionship. May the family find comfort in a quote by David M. Romano. It states, so in tomorrow starts 
Oh, so he had two German Shepherds. Oh, bless. So there you go. There's another connection there. I mean, the first connection that I feel, obviously, is his name, Riley. You know, uh, that's my surname. One, my, That's what one of the dog, my son always says, why did you give uh, uh, that dog the family name, you know? But um, I'd just run out of names, to be honest, for dogs. Uh, but, yeah, so he had two German Shepherds as well. Oh, you know... Very sad. That's without me. Don't think we're far apart. For every time you think of me, I'm right here in your heart. We're now going to listen to one of Riley's favorite songs by Zach Bryan called Something in the Orange. Now, I, um, I think I'm going to stop it there just because I know as soon as this song, song comes on, it won't be allowed on YouTube. So I think you've got the gist of the, the service. Um, as I said, I'm going to try and remember to put the link in the description box so you can then watch the whole service. Uh, it, it's been sort of freely presented on Facebook. So we'll do that. But I'm going to stop that there because, um, yeah, I don't want the song coming on and then it causing problems with the YouTube because I want this... This stream is important. I want it to go out. Uh, you know, I want us to be thinking about Riley. Okay, so let me put that. Um, just trying to remember to put uh, windows down when I finish with them, and then I'm not so it's not all confusing them for me. Okay, so the next video we're going to look at is the timeline now this is an interesting um this was uh like it's the timeline but also there's some interesting facts on it that i didn't know and photos that i hadn't seen so this is the eon news or something like that let's see e-news i don't i don't i haven't seen this publication before but anyway, so the Riley Strain investigation timeline. Just let me make sure that you can see it. Yeah, you can. So Riley Strain. Oh, that's a beautiful picture of him, isn't it? I don't know if that was his girlfriend. Uh, every picture is a beautiful picture. But this one was the open smile, that lovely open smile. And he just looks like such a nice person. Anyway, Riley Strain, uh, 22, a business and financial planning major at the University of Missouri, was among a big, a big group of Delta Chief Fraternity Brothers that arrived in Nashville by bus on Friday, March the 8th. They checked into the Tempo Hotel on Rosa L. Parks Boulevard, a short walk to the nightlife on Broadway. And this is the road that they were at. There's lots of bars along there. When they left Tempo, they went down to, I believe, Miranda Lambert's bar, Casa Rosa, first. Spent probably about an hour and 15 minutes or so. Maybe a little longer there. And then Riley's stepdad, Chris Whitfield, uh, Riley's stepdad, Chris Whitehead. Oh, is I didn't anyway. Chris later told, Oh, his stepdad. Sorry, I was thinking because that's the other Chris. That's right. So, his godfather is called Chris, he's been like the spokesperson for the family. This is so Riley's parents had separated, they both married again, but it seemed to be a very, you know, amicable. Uh, you know, now it might not have been amicable at the time when they split, but they're both in other relationships and it, you know, they've appeared all together. So his stepdad was describing what he knew of Riley's whereabouts before he went missing. Then the group went to the Garth Brooks owned friends in low places, Bar and Honky Tonk, where Riley FaceTimed his mom, Michelle Whitted, sorry, Whitted at around 7.30 p.m. I said, she said, have fun, be careful, I love you. I'm glad that she said that because that will be a comfort later 
Because <laughs> we don't say I love you, do we, to our family? You know, my son, if he goes off to the gym or whatever, I don't say I love you, you know, just before he goes. I suppose if he was going off somewhere, if he was out of, you know, away from me, and maybe I would, but maybe we don't say it often enough. I got an I love you and that's the last I heard. So he's told her that he loves her as well. So that that is nice. That will be a comfort later on at least. Chris explained that he overheard Riley detailing his evening to Michelle. He didn't even sound like he had been drinking a lot. I'm becoming more and more convinced that Riley might have been spiked. Chris told NBC News, adding that Riley continued to text with his mum for another hour or so after they spoke. Now, you know, I know young people, uh, they do tend to drink too much or maybe maybe he took something, I don't know, recreational drugs, etc. Now, Riley was a big guy, but having said that, he's a very slim guy. So, of course, drink and drugs affect different people according to your physiology or according to your tolerance to whether you've eaten or not you know there's various different reasons where where alcohol can affect you more times affect one person more than another etc um it just seems strange riley did seem just so totally out of it and you know and that last bar he was in they insisted they only served him one alcoholic drink and two waters and then the next minute they were having to throw him out so it just makes you wonder doesn't it Anyway, he added that Riley continued to text with his mum for another hour or so after they spoke. Riley's stepdad also speculated whether he could have been drugged because we're hearing the horror stories about that happening to people. I think it's so common that now. It's so terrifying. You know, uh, look at this street. Of, of how, it's just so sad that all, you know, it was probably like that, chocker, like that. And there was no help for Riley. But, you know, they say you're more likely to get help in a secluded place than a, a busy place. You tend not to get helped in a busy place because people always think somebody else will help you and they tend to walk by, don't they? Um, but, yeah, this spiking thing. I mean, when I was young, we used to go out. We used to drink other people's drinks. There was one place I used to go, go to called the Beer Keller People just used to leave their lagers, I mean, it was only mainly beer, on the table and anyone would just sort of go and have a drink of it. You know, of course, you couldn't do that now. God knows what you'd end up drinking. So, Riley was escorted out of Luke Bryan's bar because after Friends in Low Places, they went next to Luke Bryan's Luke's 32 Bridge Food and Drink. Seems like there's a lot of bars along here owned by famous people. Anyway, the Tennessee Alcoholic Beverage Commission confirmed March the 14th it was investigating whether Riley arrived at Luke's 32 Bridge visibly intoxicated and was overserved. However, the bar maintained in a statement Riley brought one, brought one drink and two waters before he was allowed, to, uh, sorry, asked to leave at 9:35 p.m based on our conduct standards, and he was escorted out through the front exit on Broadway. The business, which also noted it was cooperating with the police and the TABC, stated that a member of Riley's party accompanied him downstairs to the door, but then went back upstairs to the bar when Riley left. And I can't stress this enough. If you're out there watching, if you're a young person, if you've got young people in your family that go out and do they must always stay at least two people together because there's so many different things for men and women, for boys and girls, so many different things that can go wrong. It's, you know, you've always got to stick together when you're out. I think people, young people, myself included, when I was young, you do not realise how vulnerable you are when you get your drinking and trying to, you know, walk home, find your way home somewhere alone you're so vulnerable in so many different ways robbery uh, sex assault so many different things that can happen to you so his friend went back upstairs y'all this is scary luke bryan wrote while also sharing the restaurant statement to his instagram story praying for his safe return 
the TABC told, uh, this is, what's it called, E-News, in a statement April the 1st that it's investigating multiple places to determine whether a violation of state alcohol law occur occurred at any of the establishments where Riley was served alcohol on March the 8th. So he'll have been in other bars and maybe he did have too much before he got there. All licenses uh, licensed, well, they must have CCTV of him before he got there. Be interesting to see, was he staggering all over the place then? Because when he came out that bar, he could hardly stand up. He, was, he fell over, he banged his, well, it looked like he maybe banged his head, crashed into this, he was stood there like he was, I mean, the CCTV is very upsetting. All licensed establishments questioned have been cooperative, the agency said. The final report uh, will be made public once the investigation has been closed. Um, it has been closed. So... Apparently, it wasn't Rash, uh, Riley's first time in Nashville, according to his stepdad, but he and his friends got separated. The boys called him and he said, I'm walking back to my hotel, but he was going the wrong way. They didn't think anything about it. And, you know, I, I can understand that. And there he was, just standing there as people went past. Uh, what was he doing or what did he think he was doing? A security camera outside an escape room business captured Riley on 3rd Avenue North, cutting across a parking lot and going in a different direction. And another camera recorded him on Gay Street Crossing, 1st Avenue North at 9.47pm. On reaching the corner, he stopped and staggering a bit, looked back in the direction he'd just come from before continuing down the street. Police shared both videos on social media during the investigation. Chris said they wanted to see what was happening before the parking lot and we'd also like to know what happened after he crossed onto Gay Street because there's such a void that we haven't seen. There's something there that's going to fill some gaps. So Riley's father, Ryan Gilbert, told uh, the uh, WSMV, he made it, as far as we know, basically to the James Robertson Parkway Bridge, and that's the critical time where things went dark. The last Life 360 ping from Riley's phone came from near the bridge, which crosses the Cumberland River, according to his parents and stepdad. So these are the bridges that go across the river. According to what Riley's friends told Chris, as he detailed to WSMV, when the rest of the group got back to the hotel that night and saw he wasn't there, they went back out to look for him, tried to track him using snapshot location, uh, sorry, Snapchat locations. When that proved fruitless and then Riley wasn't to be found in any of the other rooms where roughly 30 members of the fraternity were staying, the girls called Chris and Michelle. Imagine that phone call. Oh, my God, your heart would just sink, wouldn't it? He and Riley's mum jumped in the car and drove straight to Nashville from Springfield. So that's when the investigation began, wasn't it? And all the media, you know, mainstream media and social media sort of descended. Police said they responded to the Tempo Hotel March 9th in response to a call about a missing person. A friend of Riley's called 911 and told the dispatcher one of his good buddies was missing. So according to a recording of the call obtained by WKRN. Can we listen to the call? I, don't, I haven't listened to the call, but I'm just going to see if we can. Uh, I don't think so. Oh, hang on. No. <laughs> oh, bless me. <laughs> we can't. Sorry. So I'll go back uh, to where I was. Um, sorry, I'm going to see. <laughs> 
When we got into town Saturday evening, we met with uh, an officer and he has been amazing as far as I'm concerned. Chris told uh, WKRM. He made phone calls, he radioed police uh, people to go and check locations while he was with us. He was making phone calls and he sent the report out and it hit the national database. I felt like things were handled very well and he was very helpful. A police report noted that Verizon Wireless determined that the last ping from Riley's phone was 0.64 miles southwest of a cell tower located at 19 Oldham Street near the river, but a search of the area came up empty. Oh. We talk every day, multiple times a day, Michelle told WSMV three days into the search. This is the longest I've ever gone without talking to him. So, Chris described his uh, stepson as a very identifiable young man. Six foot seven. Six foot seven. That, uh, that's taller. I think my son is six foot five or six foot six, so even taller than him. With blonde hair and blue eyes. Bless him. Bless him. We're in a bad dream, he said. Can we wake up, please? Just let us wake up. And Michelle added, oh, God, bud, we love you so much and we're all looking for you, all of us. If anyone knows anything, please call the police. So this was him as he was walking down the sidewalk and a police, so this was from a police body cam. The police did actually see him. A police officer saw him and did speak to him. On March the 17th, police shared that two women who were voluntarily aiding in the search, well, these were the two TikTokers, they found Riley's bank card on the embankment, uh, embankment between Gay Street and the Cumberland River. And then police shared the latest video they'd obtained of Riley on the night of March the 8th. He had a brief interaction with a cop responding to a vehicle burglary on Gay Street on a, sidework, a sidewalk adjacent to the Cumberland River and the officer can be heard we've seen this uh, interaction the officer can be heard asking Riley how he's doing which to which the young man replied I'm good how are you and kept walking uh, and he seemed to sort of come round a bit then it's probably because he saw a policeman <laughs> so to those who are saying they believe he could have been in distress that somebody could have been after him as he walked on Gay Street. Well, as you see in the video, this is a police spokesman. He's walking by himself on the riverside and speaks to a police officer as the officer is looking at a vehicle that had been broken into too. So, so far, the officer said they had found no evidence to suggest Riley had been a victim of foul play. And stepdad Chris told NBC News the family had been able to access all of Riley's accounts except for the one linked to the bank card, I wonder why, and that there had been no credit or debit charges on any of them during the search. I want Riley to know we're actively looking for you, son, he said. We're going to bring you home. Well, I'll tell you what, the, the card, the debit card, could easily have been flung out of his wallet by someone. They don't want credit cards. They don't want anything with his name on that could link them to him. Uh, you know, they can't use a credit card or a debit card because they'd have to go to an ATM and they haven't got the PIN number. And they'd have to go to an ATM and ATMs are all filmed, aren't they? So they'd have to disguise their face, etc. And they wouldn't want that tension. So I think it's perfectly likely that um, somebody might have stolen Riley's wallet. Um, you know, I'm not saying they necessarily even did anything to him. But I think, you know, seeing in that there's a lot of homeless encampments around there. But don't even have to, you know, can't even blame it on the homeless people. Perhaps the homeless people would be the last ones to do it. But a lot of people would do that, uh, you know, steal somebody's wallet when someone's in a vulnerable condition and they, they want to get rid of the i think the first thing they'd want to get rid of is the debit card because it's got his name on it you know if they steal the cash uh you know they'd want to get rid of the wallet as well but if they steal the cash that's different because people can't trace that anyway then the search hit the water 
and they were uh, Chris shared during a March 19th press conference that the family was getting an assist from the United Cajun Navy, a volunteer-based disaster response agency. We appreciate more than you'll ever know the outpouring that we've received from the community, uh, from the press and everyone else involved, he said. Our goal is still to bring Riley home. We feel it is still a very viable goal. You know, f hopes fade every day more that someone's missing, don't they? But I think there was still a possibility that Riley could have been in hospital somewhere. You know, uh, I don't know. There's always There was always an outside chance that it might be okay somewhere. Anyway, up to then, they were still... Um, hoping and the police were stressed to the media they're continuing to follow up up on tips doing everything they could to find riley and then on march the 20th the chetham county sheriff's office oversaw which they described as a basic shutdown at the chetham lock and dam where the cumberland river flows into chetham lake in connection with the search and they sifted through debris that subsequently floated to the surface. Riley's dad Ryan was also out on a different part of the river that day, the station reported, on a boat with the United Cajun Navy. I've got to be here, he told WKRN, I've got to be on the water. I wanted to be on the water last week and we had some other family members that took the role that day, but I'm glad to be here today. Uh, because I want to be here, I want to be the one that finds him. <laughs> oh dear. Anyway, of course, as we know, bodies of water, rivers, etc., do not give up their secrets easily. You know, people searching. How often have we seen cases where people are searching for them, don't find them, and then, you know, they get found by members of the public? So this, uh, on uh, March 22nd at 7.28 a.m., a local worker, we're going to listen to the uh, 911 call again later in one of the videos, called the police to report seeing a body. And, uh, yeah, that was it, really. The Davidson County Medical Examiner's Office identified Riley, but his other... Uh, but also his black and white shirt and other identifiable objects on the body, including a watch, also indicated it was him. Now, they didn't say at the time he was not wearing his jeans or his cowboy boots and his wallet was not there. So they concentrated more on what was there and did not mention what wasn't there. Anyway, the police officer said, I want to say to the family, my heart and prayers go out to you all for this very unfortunate, tragic incident. I also want to say thank you to the Nashville community and the outpouring of support from the community in trying to help us locate Mr. Strain. Factoring in his height and weight, investigators had estimated when and where Riley's body might surface if he'd gone into the water. So... Now, we found that in the Nicola Bully case, didn't we? And I didn't know that before, and I think a lot of us didn't know that before, and there was much consternation when Andrew Snowden came out and said he thought, you know, that the police had predicted when Nicola's body would surface. Uh, but, of course, if, you know, if they would have just said that at the time, that that was the reason, they do it on a scientific basis. So uh, this is the 14th day, the chief explained, so we were really expecting any time soon to find him. We were in the right spot. It's just unfortunate. He said there was no other evidence to suggest anything other, other than Riley fell into the river. Now, in view of what we know now, that seems ridiculous. He had no trousers or boots on. Anyway, Riley's dad, mum and stepfather all wore green, his favourite colour, to police headquarters that afternoon. And speaking to reporters, Michelle said, I just ask that you mummers out there, you hug your babies tight tonight, please, please, for me. Just hug your babies tight tonight. 
all. That does make me proud. And I did do that. And uh, I think my son was like, what are you doing? You know, we've sort of gone past the, the point where really we do hugs. You know, he's obviously he's a grown man now. But, uh, you know, I did give him a hug uh, to his uh, sort of amazement and chagrin. I mean, I do hug him some, you know, if we were going, you know, if I'm going somewhere, we do have occasional hugs, but you know what I mean. It's not like when they're little and you're always hugging and that, they get to an age where they don't want to be hugged. They're certainly at 27, you don't want to be hugged. And again, thank you, thank you for sharing our story. So the autopsies, now an autopsy was performed on March the 23rd. Uh, and it still said it was accidental, no signs of foul play. Toxicology report results pending. In the meantime, Riley's family hired a private company to perform an independent autopsy. However, this came out just like theirs did, said Chris Dingman. No obvious signs of trauma, no weapons, guns, knives, etc., but they were able to do a little more testing on specific items. He also referred to a police report that stated Riley didn't have on his jeans and his boots and his wallet wasn't recovered. Now, the full results of that autopsy have not been released yet, so they're still waiting. Another thing that threw the family for a loop was the coroner going on record with a news person in Nashville stating about the lack of water in his lungs. It raises more questions. You know, I'm not a crime drama person by no means. This is what Chris said, not me, I am a crime drama person. But usually water in the lungs means that, you know, they were alive when they went into the water. So this is him with his mum, our oh, poor Michelle. And then the family went into the rituals of mourning, a visitation and celebration of life were held on March 29th. And according to an online obituary, it was paid tribute to Riley's vibrant spirit and loving nature. They're planning a private burial. All ah, right, so he's not been buried yet. It was a celebration of life. And the family requested that attendees wear something green, dress comfortably to honour his love of life. Okay, so I, th I thought that was a very good uh, summary of, you know, what happened to Riley Strain, what we know so far. Very, very good uh, summary with all the pertinent points. So now, what we're going to look at now. Now, I did have another similar article as that, but I don't think I need to go through the other article because I think that was very, very comprehensive. So I'm going to go to the videos now that I've got. Uh, what have I put on my list of the way to do it? Yeah, I think I'm going to show you some photos that somebody sent me. In a, a, yeah, I think first of all, we'll look at this CCTV. Now, there's a massive amount of CCTV, two and a half, three hours. Uh, and one of uh, somebody has very kindly sort of looked at that CCTV, but which must have taken them ages. And uh, I'm going to play that for you uh, because it does feel, it does seem like you see what may well be Riley standing up against the fence here, having some sort of um, conversation with somebody or somebody comes up, you know, I ju we're just going to watch it and you can tell me what you think. Uh, I'm not brilliant with these kind of things, but I do think you, it does look like you can see Riley here. So let's go back to the beginning. So what they've done is they've shortened it. Thank goodness. They've gone for it, shortened it to what they think is a pertinent, pertinent point. Now you'll see there's a lot of traffic. You know, I mean not loads, it's a but you know, there's quite a few cars go past. Somebody just walked past there.
I do feel that whatever happens to Riley will have happened, you know, in a moment. Now, here is what is thought may be Riley coming up here. Certainly looks like it could be him, but these things need looking at by an expert, you know. Um, and there's a scooter goes past. And then this figure, which does look like it could well be Riley, comes up. And they stand there at this fence. I think it's some sort of a fence or a wall. They're there for quite a while. What were they doing? I think that's got to be Riley. It even looks like the black shirt, black and white shirt, doesn't it? And the jeans. Maybe he was throwing up over the fence. So you can see standing there for quite a few minutes. What is he doing? Maybe he's just hanging on. Maybe he's just, you know, it's like we're feeling sick in the room, you know, the, his head spinning. Or is he talking to someone? I think Riley is a person who would talk to anyone. And unfortunately, being that trusting and in that state that he was in, that could be dangerous. Is he talking to someone there? Looks like he is. Now, I saw in another video, another YouTuber's, uh, I think he's called Gray, somebody, he showed a bit where there was somebody running along the road and then when they saw the police, they stopped running and started walking as if, you know, they were had no reason to run away. And he pointed out that he thought that was suspicious because I, th and I agree with him, it is because... You know, if you're, if someone's running away. It was as if they were running away and then they saw a vehicle and then stopped running and just started walking as if, oh, everything's fine, I'm not really running away. I mean, what is going on there? I mean, I think they've made a... Br Thank you uh, to my subscribers for sending this. I think they've done a brilliant job with it, but it does need, you know needs an expert to look at it at the end of the day we're not experts we're just uh, interested parties if you like interested because we want to know what happened to riley and we want to help the family but we're not experts on cctv there'll be a way of probably making that even clearer that the experts will know about see how long he's there for it's a long time really what is he doing if it is him I mean it may not be him it may not be him but it does look like him Yeah, now what happen what happens here? There's a car goes past. Now he's going back the way he came. Another car going past. So Pete there were lots of people around. People saw something. And then the police appear. The police appear, what they're there for, I have no idea, but this person is still over here. There. And they appear to be saying something to him. 
shouting over the road. Surely that is Riley. So if they, well, I'm not sure if they were police or security guards, but surely that, well, it looks like Riley. Who is it if it's not Riley? They need to at least eliminate that person. More traffic going by, more vehicles. What happens now? Is he with someone else there or is it? It looks like there might be two people. I'm not sure. Where's he going now? Going off up here? Yeah, there are two people there, definitely. Wow. Okay, so that's something else. And then another thing they sent me and I want us to look at were some photos or screenshots that came off uh, JLR's channel, which JLR didn't seem to take it much notice of and maybe there is nothing in it. Um, let's have a look. Where's Riley's folder? Right, let me share this. Okay, so there's some photos of Riley on here. Uh, this is my folder. So these pictures. Now, this was a screenshot uh, taken from JLR's video. And what my subscriber said was, are these jeans? Is this a cowboy boot? I mean, how could it be missed? You know, that's the only thing I think is, um, I'm not sure, you know, is that a cowboy boot? I can't make it any bigger than that. You know, it's beyond my skills, I'm afraid. Now, I did look at this and I think maybe they're not jeans, maybe that's a shirt. Uh, when I asked uh, other people, when I've asked other people what they think, somebody did so that's a plastic bag and that's a leaf you know which it could be again these kind of things they need um enhancing and they need an expert to look at them but it's possible to be jeans and a cowboy boot you'd like to look at it and and see now i know that riley's jeans could be useful to a homeless person they could have been uh, I don't know if they were designer jeans. You know, if they were designer jeans, you know, oh, people have been robbed for less, haven't they? People have been robbed for their trainers, for their God knows what, if they're Nike or, I don't know, some good make or whatever. It just leaves me cold, all that. I'm not interested. I have no interest in designer clothes, designer anything. If I, You know, I'd much rather buy a lot of different clothes. You know, I uh, I like to change clothes often, so I'm not really that bothered about designer things. But maybe they were expensive and the person was thinking they could either sell them or they fancied some designer clothes. But, yeah, this, uh, you can see it's got the JLR uh, trade, uh, what's not trade, watermark in the corner. So, yeah, what do we think? Are they... Is that a cowboy boot? It looks, looks a little bit like it could be. Or is it a leaf? 
are these jeans i did look at that and i thought is that a collar um but they look they could be as i say nobody's saying this is what they are what we're saying is these things need looking at now what i am doing is all this uh, as the family of sorry as the family have asked for help all this i'm going to send off to um I'm going to send off to the family or the spokesperson of the family. I've left him a message on Facebook to ask for a, an email or something or how I can get it to them. I'm going to try and get, get all this information to them. And then, you know, they'll probably have a private investigator that's dealing with it. The thing is, it may be nothing. None of it may be anything, but at least uh, we should look at it. You know, we should send it them to look at. Uh, I think I've shown that one, have I? Ah, uh, no. So then it comes out. So the reason that I've decided to go ahead with these videos is because the family friend or the stepfather, uh, not stepfather, sorry, godfather, family friend who we saw in the very first uh, video has, you know, released uh, a video with News Nation and he's been on nancy grace and we're going to look at that as well saying that they do want information so we're going to try and help as a community as a true crime community we're going to try and help them as well as we can we may not be able to help but we're going to try so let's have a look at this his interview chris's interview and then come home in a hearse the family of Riley Strain doesn't have to imagine that awful scenario. They've experienced it. And tonight they have more details and more questions about the death of 22-year-old Missouri College student Riley Strain. Was it really an accident, as police say? Well, tonight the focus on is on one key accessory that Riley was apparently wearing the night he disappeared from downtown Nashville, a belt. New information from the Strain family points to a possibility of a more sinister ending to the young man's life than the initial autopsy suggested. The Nashville Police Department has determined there were no signs of foul play. Riley's body was pulled from the Cumberland River two weeks after he vanished, about eight miles away after a night out with friends. He allegedly left a local bar by himself. There is security footage of him walking off, but in the wrong direction, in the opposite direction of his hotel. Yeah, so she's just going through sort of the scenario. Riley was found in the river without his pants, his wallet, or his cowboy boots that he was wearing the night he went missing. And despite a massive intensive search of the area, those items of clothing have never turned up. The family says Riley was also wearing a belt the night he disappeared. Joining us now is Strain family friend, Chris Dingman. Chris. This is the key thing now that they're coming out with. Where is his belt? I mean, really, where are his jeans? Where are his cowboy boots? If they came off in the water, which does seem really unlikely, and you'll see from some of the people we see speaking, it seems very unlikely. Um, where are they? Shoes normally float. You know, is somebody walking around in those cowboy boots right now as we're speaking? Is somebody wearing his jeans? Is somebody wearing his belt? Now, as I said, Riley was very lean, wasn't he? So he would wear a belt to keep his jeans up. You know, uh, I personally don't need a belt to keep mine up. So I've got plenty of other, you know, uh, flesh to keep it up. But Riley was very slim, so he would have needed a belt. Where is his belt? Uh, great to have you back on the show. Um, it's the first time I've had you on the show since uh, Riley's funeral. I just first want to ask, how are Michelle and Chris and the rest of his family doing? You know, I, I got to visit with them today. They came over to the office for a little bit and we got to catch up and, you know, just talk about life, being home. Uh, Michelle was able to talk just a little bit and then instantly, you know, went into memories and, and missing her son. So. It, it's still very, very brutal on the family right now. Uh, we're in the stage right now where we want answers. Yeah. Uh, we were able and blessed to bring Riley home and, you know, to bury him properly. But now the war room is totally turned into getting answers because people know th there's some answers out there that, that we need to have. And what are those answers that you need and what, how are they related to this belt that he, he and 
uh, was apparently wearing that night that his parents say he wore every day. Yeah, uh, there's still some people of interest. Uh, we noticed that the News Nation actually reached out Friday to the uh, Metro Nashville Police Department following up on the investigation, seeing if there was any new information and was told abruptly that there was no investigation. They were waiting for toxicology. So unlike, uh, more like what we have found this entire time of doing this, trying to find Riley, is we're going to have to find our information via the internet, via TikTok, via incredible reporters like you guys chasing down leads, because I, I strongly feel that we're not going to get any support from uh, Metro Nashville. Uh, our two strong... So this is why we're doing this video tonight, is because the family are asking for help. So we're going to help as much as we can. As I say, we may not be able to help, it may, but we're going to try our best. Uh, and it's nice, uh, well, it's horrible, you know, you, you'd hope that the police would be helping, really. But they seem to be sort of blanked by the police, like the police don't want to look into things. They should look into it. And I, all right, I know they're starved of resources. They're probably short of resources. It's a very busy place, isn't it? I'm sure. Nashville, Tennessee, there's probably all sorts of things going on. I think we found that with the um, 911 call. It's like the, the woman just sounded bored shitless, basically. But she probably has all sorts of things coming in. But um, it's up to the family in these cases, isn't it? The family need to push it, and they are pushing it, and I don't blame them. They'll push it until they get all the answers. Once they've got their answers, they'll accept whatever the result is, whether it... You know, whether it was accidental death, maybe went off for a, you know, a toilet break, sort of, and then just accidentally fell in. Maybe that's why he didn't. Well, I can't see if that's why he did I don't think he would have taken off his whole jeans to go to the toilet in his boots. Uh, but, you know, stranger things have happened, I suppose, when you're drunk, maybe. But um, And maybe he did fall in by accident. Maybe he did just drop his debit card on the side all these things are possible but the thing is that the family are right to get those answers this leads that we have received has been from the internet uh not from the police stuff that was given to the police so and when know, are those I, leads uh the leads were like right there with the body cam uh you know we had people that had found the debit card shortly following that mm -hmm. uh the couple that actually come forward from listening to a podcast that was in the last video uh, right. that he was seen by the construction barricade you know that, uh, there's so little but and when you're watching the film that you're showing right now with the police cam when it spins around there's actually uh there's some people that's farther down the way that looks like they're sitting outside their vehicle but what is the, uh, hey, hey, Chris, what's the significance of the belt? Because, listen, uh, you know, a lot of people don't realize that when something happens to a person, whether, for example, they're hit by a car, they're often knocked out of their shoes, out of their clothes. People don't understand that that actually happens. Same thing happens yes. when a person falls into a river. Items of clothing can be ripped off by the current, by the force of the fall. Um, he still had his shirt on. And you say mm -hmm. that because of a belt, he should have still had his pants on. Can you explain why you're si attaching so much significance to the fact that you say he was wearing a belt? These pictures are so distressing of Riley, uh, so distressing. His poor family. Yeah, the belt, uh, Riley was, was, had a swimmer's body, and I love him for that. He was actually an excellent swimmer. And his hips, with the belt being on his hips, that would have been even more hard for the pants to come off in the water. It literally would have been snug to him. It would have been riding on his hips. Uh, everybody we've talked to about that, as soon as we found out he had a belt on that night, was like, wow, that totally changes the dynamics of why those articles are missing. Uh, his boots, they're a size 15 boot. Uh, anytime any shoes or tennis shoes get wet, you know how hard it is just to get well, you can see how it would be easy for him to fall in the river if he got close enough to the edge. See, oh, God, it's so scary, isn't it? The river is right here, isn't it? So you'd only have to be walking up in this park thing and you could fall into the river. It's, oh, please, 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 all of you be careful when you're ever, you're anywhere, whether you're drunk or not, you know, uh, whether you've taken recreational drugs or not, just be careful near the water. And please, please implore. I know young people don't tend to listen 
to what us oldies have to say because you know they think they know it all i was <laughs> that was me once um but we must try and drum this into them they're not to go near water when they've had too much to drink and they should always stay with at least one friend the tennis shoe off let alone a oh. size 15 boot so the belt is a big piece of the puzzle that we now have and uh but once again raises more questions uh, and when do you expect the results you have ordered the family has ordered a second autopsy to be performed when do you expect to have results from that they were actually uh, following up on that today and reached out we were told which we've not been given the information by the original autopsy but we were told a family member can request the actual autopsy short of the toxicology that metro nashville provided uh, we were not aware of that information. So the family uh, did reach out today, uh, I think left messages to try to get that initial report also. So we're hoping within the next 24 hours to, to get more answers than we currently have. Right. But he does appear to be spiked, you know, unless he was so totally out of it. You know, even when you're out of it, you might be stumbling a little bit, but you're not normally quite as bad as that. Maybe he was spiked. I also wish we would have been given that when it was done a week ago. Yeah, that would have been helpful. Thanks so much for watching. Go to joinnn.com. Okay. Let me put that down. So that was another video I wanted to show you. So I've got one more video to show you. And this is one of my, I mean, you know, I know some of you don't like Nancy Grace. I think she's bloody brilliant, to be honest. And at the end of the day, we're love her or hate her, you cannot take away from the fact you know, she was a public prosecutor. She was a prosecutor for years. That was her career. And when she's talking to people, even sometimes, you know, you know, it's a, it's a, even sometimes the people maybe she shouldn't be interrogating. It's just her, you know, she asks the right questions. At the end of the day, she's got many years of experience. She asks the right questions. I thought that interview of her with Sebastian Rogers' parents was brilliant. Uh, you know, well, of his mom and his stepdad. Just she asks the right questions. She knows exactly the right questions to ask. But not only of the, you know, people that she feels like she has to question, but also the guests that appear on her show. They must be terrified. Even the forensic experts, etc., that she has on, she interrogates them as if she was, you know, in a courtroom. And I find it fascinating. And I think. You can love her or hate her, maybe you don't like her style, uh, but she gets results, she's got results, and um, it, I just think people always, it's always yes or no, <laughs> I, you know, answer my question, yes or no, she won't let people go around the houses, uh, she asks the relevant questions, she knows the questions to ask, she's got a wealth of experience in prosecuting and in court cases in general. So I think, you know, lover or hater, you can't sort of deny that. So let's have a look at Nancy Grace. In, and so she's talking about, um, she's interviewing Chris, the guy with, who was just interviewed there on uh, News Nation. I also think she's got an empathy with the victims. She's like a bit tough love, uh, Nancy Grace, but, you know, I agree with that and that's the way I am and uh, though sometimes maybe I'm a bit too soppy, but um, I'm sure she's soppy as well uh, in, her, in real life. But, yeah, I, I enjoy her interviews and I always find them interesting to watch. But that's what we're going to watch now. So if Nancy Grace is not your cup of tea, uh, you don't need to watch it. That is just one of the many phrases used to describe Riley Strain. So why now has a second autopsy been ordered? Sorry, I just want to go back to that. That is just one of the... That phrase. That is just oh, one I mean, of the many phrases used how to describe... Riley so why now anyway. has a second autopsy been ordered very disturbing facts emerge about the discovery of his body what does it mean i'm nancy grace this is crime stories thank you for being with us here at crime stories and on sirius xm 111 a second autopsy why take a listen to dave mack 
crime online. The body of Riley Strain was found submerged under a log in the Cumberland River, eight miles downriver from where he was last seen. Strain still had on the white and black shirt he was last seen wearing, but his boots, pants, and wallet were missing. Officials say it's not uncommon for clothing to come off drowning victims in the water. The initial autopsy report says no sign of foul play, but the family has ordered a... I'm just wondering, are these his boots here? The boots that he had on, they look very heavy, don't they? Massive, of course, because they're size 15. Now, would the heaviness make them come off, uh, more likely to come off, or would the heaviness stop them from coming off? All I know is sometimes you can't get these boots off even when you're trying to, so I'm not sure how that, but, you know, the force of the water can do that. The second private autopsy saying no water in his lungs raises questions about drowning. The claim that the coroner noted a lack of water in Strain's lungs has not been publicly confirmed. That's a problem. Death by drowning, but no water in the victim's lungs. You know what? Let's don't put the cart before the horse. Let's start at the beginning to figure out what, if anything, uh, we can, based on the knowledge that we are learning from the autopsies. How did it start? Listen. What's the exact location of your emergency? Yes, ma'am, I'm at. Yeah, this 911 call, we listened to it, didn't we? Uh, the, the woman on this 911 call, she needs retraining. They need to take her back to 911 call school and uh, remind her, maybe she's just been doing it for so long she's got cynical. But, you know, this guy who rings up, he, he obviously so he knows all about Riley Strain because he's working on the river there. It's been the big news for two weeks. And he's so excited that he's found Riley, isn't he? As well as it must have been traumatised for him. But you can see he's probably happy that he's found Riley. He's going to put the family out of their misery, if you like, of not knowing what's happened to him. And he's all sort of excited about it and she's just like mm, mm. and he she just totally dampens down uh how he feels like he feels you know he's doing his public duties got something important to relate and she's just not interested so maybe that's just because if she's been doing it a long time i think these people are you know and i feel for them because they hear some horrible things but maybe on a regular basis at least once a year they should go back to remind them of the because I expect with a job like this, you start off really, you know, taking every call seriously and whatever. And then after five years, you're probably like, oh, what you found a body like she is here. At seventeen forty, sixty uh, first Avenue North, Nashville, Tennessee. Um, I, so, I just sixty first Avenue North in the nation's office city. Yes, ma'am. Uh, and what happened? Uh, uh, my company works on the river. I have just found a uh, dead body. I believe it to be Riley. Oh, you know what? No matter how many cases you investigate, you prosecute, you cover, when you hear that, it stops you in your tracks. After all the searching, all the prayers, all the maneuvers to hear that. Now, she's sort of saying almost the opposite in a way. She's saying no matter how many cases she's done, she never loses that feeling. But I, I, I think for the 911 operators, I think they do. They must just get so used to it. So they do need a little reminder every now and again, I think, of, of how it how important each, because especially in a big city like that with a lot going on, I mean, different if you're a 911 operator for a small town or whatever, it's probably very rare you would get anything that, uh, out of the ordinary happening. But, uh, and so it would be like, oh, what, what, yeah. When, you, when you're dealing with big cities, it's probably, you know, Every, as soon as you put that phone, that uh, the phone down from that call, there would have been something else probably equally traumatic. I found a dead body. I believe it to be Riley. Joining me and all star panel to make sense of what we know right now. But first, to a special guest joining us, 
uh, very dear family friend, family spokesperson for Raleigh Strain's family, Chris Dingman. Chris, thank you for being with us. Thank you for having me this morning. Chris, I know the family is coming off a very emotional funeral and that milestone, I guess, is something you have to go through to move to the next point. But I'd like to address the evidence, the forensic evidence, to try and analyze what happened to Riley. Because I, I find it very difficult to believe he fell in the water, nobody knew about it, heard about it, heard him yell, nothing at all. And then he turns up without his pants on, his um, boots, his wallet, all missing. I have a problem with that. I've got a big problem with that. Yeah, and this about the nobody heard any noise. So nobody heard a scream. Nobody heard a splash. I mean, he's a big guy. I mean, he's six foot seven. <laughs> You're telling me that all those people were, that were there around about there, nobody heard a splash. As I think I've said, I've heard my dog jump into a, a lake, like a just tiny little sort of 14, 12, 14 kilo dog uh, jump into a river and I heard it from a distance. So how could nobody, out of all those people that were, were there that we saw going past, etc., cetera, um, how could nobody have heard a splash or a scream? And that, that's something that I always think of with the Nicola Bully case as well. Nobody heard a splash. And she was obviously was smaller uh, than Riley, but there were people round about and you would hear a splash. So I think that's a big uh, question. Needs to be answered. Why did nobody hear a splash? I know you just heard the 911 call. Chris, how did Riley's family discover a body had been found? Um, we were, the family was actually notified uh, via a reporter, pre the police calling us, letting us know that they had found Riley, uh, which I, it's not, I guess, it's ironic that most of our information has come from the media and not the police, but that's my personal opinion on this. But yeah, we were notified just literally moments before the police actually notified that it had not been verified, but they were pretty sure they had found Riley, uh, which, you know, put the family in a, in a spin at that moment. They had been searching so hard for a positive ending, but also had ultimately found the ending. Yeah, I, I, I'm taking in everything that you're saying, but that feeling, that hearing those words, is something that stays with you the rest of your life. I know. I know that. When I first heard that my fiance was dead, I really didn't believe it. I, I, my mind was playing all sorts of games to, to, oh, if I can get there, maybe there's been an accident. I can fix it. Where is he? I'll, 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 I'll fix it. And it wasn't until I saw my pastor Wright Bernstein funeral home that I realized what was happening and then it took me a really long time to take it in who answered that phone call his mom or dad uh actually it was a joint call to the family uh his stepdad and mom was at the house uh ryan uh, his dad was already out uh had just left the house i think to go towards the boat uh, to get on it to search and i was leaving the house and we noticed that you know They'd gotten an important phone call because they got quiet, but we had to go chase down some leads. So, oh, I hate uh, that feeling, go... Chris. Chris, I hate that I feeling. Know. When there's buzz going on, all of a sudden somebody's on the phone and everything gets quiet, and you're like, what is it? Yeah, we were... So, yeah, you could see how that'd be like. Everyone's there getting ready to search again for Riley, and it's all going on. And Although... It's funny because I should imagine that even though they know in their hearts it's probably not going to have a positive outcome, 
they're probably sort of thinking that maybe it might there's always that little hope and then that phone call comes in all the police go quiet they're probably all looking at the parents like oh god how we've got to go and tell them now um it must just have been awful it's like the world stops chasing the lead mom and um, who else on the phone there's his stepdad chris the other chris yes so did his mother expect this or was she completely floored when she got the news michelle at, at one point we did have a family conversation of of the bad outcome that could happen um she was prepared but only as you can prepare a mother that's missing her her cub you know uh she knew that with the days that went by and the lack of evidence and the lack of stuff that was being generated at you know in nashville itself by the police department that it may not have a, a, a happy out you know outcome but she never gave up hope uh to find her her son we never gave up trying and we were blessed with the media getting Riley's story out, generating the leads that we needed. Because at that point, literally the media, the social networks is the only leads that we had been given, period, uh, as to what had happened to Riley. Guys, uh, again, thank you for being with us. As this family mourns the death of Riley, I want answers. I, I, I So far, we keep hearing that his death, quote, continues to appear accidental but you know I, I i don't get it i don't get it ben power is joining me high profile lawyer joining us out of this jurisdiction at legalpowers.com ben thank you for being with us why would they say it quote continues to appear accidental when he what he accidentally threw his pants his shoes and his wallet and jumped in the fell in the water that doesn't make any sense. Why are they saying that? Well, so when it comes to the medical examiner making that type of determination, what they're looking for is clear. Now this Ben Powers, you'll see, he's like, look, he's trying to be sort of very motionless and, you know, Nancy just sort of wipes the floor with him, basically, bless him. Uh, but, you know, that's his job, I suppose. If you're an attorney, that's why I suppose I could never have been an attorney. Or I would have been like Nancy, you know, she's impassioned. I would it would have had to have been prosecution, it couldn't have been defense. But um he's like more, you know, you sort of uh typical attorney if you like, they're supposed to be completely emotionless, aren't they? Clear signs of trauma, you know, a gunshot wound, a clear stab wound, something like that. And a medical examiner's determination, no signs of foul play or no signs of trauma consistent with foul play is a determination that's not static, it's fluid. So if new information is developed, new information comes forward, witness, witnesses come forward with whatever they may know, that can definitely change the determination that the medical examiner makes. But right now, I don't put a whole lot of stock in the no foul play trauma determination because someone pushing Riley in, throwing Riley in, punching Riley and tossing him in that way or just pushing him down the embankment is going to look exactly identical to him falling in it's indistinguishable wait, the type of wait. injuries you have ben powers look at his face he looks terrified there because she's going to tell him off now i hate everything that you just said and i'm going to tell you why but i need backup joining me right now uh high profile medic high profile death investigator professor of forensics jacksonville state university author of blood beneath my feet on amazon what else can i say let's see um and star of a hit series body bags with joe scott morgan joe scott now i know you're used to getting in front of juries and giving a very lengthy explanation of cod cause of death but i have one question and it's a yes no joe scott yes or no Okay, here's the question. Isn't it true that death investigators and medical examiners take into account before they reach their determination, not only the physical evidence that you get from the body, but extrinsic evidence as well? 
I did think this was so interesting. This is what I, as well I like about the Nancy Grace channel. You get to know things that you didn't know before. This about extrinsic evidence. So it's not only the evidence that they find from the post-mortem, you know, from the actual examination. It's from the situation. You know, they're supposed to take all that into account as well. Uh, not you know the, the situation of where how they're found etc so she goes on to explain this such as i had an arson case okay uh was it an accident did this wife really die in a fire well oh my god i found this was so interesting so she's talking about this arson case where a wife died in a fire was it an accidental fire and um, evidentially it wasn't I looked at extrinsic evidence, including the fact that her husband took all of his suits, all of his shoes, all of his ties to a dry cleaner, multiple dry cleaners in the area in the days before the fire, uh, called the weather station, and I had him on tape finding out if it would rain that day, the day of the fire, and um, also calling his insurance company to find out would they pay for furniture replacement. And then, bam, his mansion caught on fire and his wife died. That's extrinsic evidence. Strange that, isn't it? So after he's taken all his clothes out of the house or any clothes that he wanted, put them in dry cleaners, after he's phoned the insurance company, after he's phoned to see what the weather's going to be like that day, is it going to rain? And she goes on to say, after he's taken all his personal belongings out of the house, like, photos etc of his family his own family all of a sudden this house goes on fire and his wife dies it's, somehow maybe he knew not to mention raiding his place of business and finding bags and bags trash bags black plastic trash bags as i recall full of things from the home such as his own family photos not her but his family, his mom, his grandma, blah, blah, blah. That's yeah, extrinsic yeah, evidence. Yeah. So my question to you is, isn't it true the medical examiner can take into account extrinsic evidence when determining whether there's been foul play? I can't believe it. He did it, Jackie. He actually said it in one word. I'm circling back. So Ben Powers, the extrinsic evidence I'm talking about would be the fact that he doesn't have all pants. How's that an accident? No, and I, I agree. I think that the fact that he doesn't have on pants but still has on his boxers is definitely something of concern because if they're trying to say that the river current took his pants off, you're telling me that something that's indiscriminate in tearing his pants from his body is delicate enough to leave his undergarments that just doesn't make any sense. And then when you factor that in with... Yeah, it does make you wonder, isn't it? If it took his jeans off, his belt off, now we're hearing, uh, why did it not take his boxers off? Boxers are not tight-fitting normally, are they? You know, um, yeah. So how did it take his jeans off, his boots off, but it didn't take his boxers off? The, the debit card found on the riverbank just continues to make so many irregularities eventually you have to acknowledge this doesn't add up the math doesn't math because you've got the debit card on the riverbank the pants are missing but the boxers are still sorry i just wonder so apparently this debit card hadn't been used or attempted to have been used but i just want to talk about his watch as well he had an apple watch i think or some so you know some electronic type watch that uh surely they'll have data from that now you could say, if it was foul play, why didn't someone steal that to sell it on? But, you know, again, these are things that leave a trace. You know, if somebody would have taken that watch, I think everybody would know that there was still would be a trace being left of it, you know. Same with his mobile. I don't know where his mobile was. They haven't mentioned his mobile, really. You know, but these things, if it, I think anyone who knows even rudimentary Thing about crime would know you don't take someone's you turn someone's mobile off so that it doesn't ping anywhere uh, as far as a, a fitbit sapper watches anything like that that registers 
some sort of trail, digital trail, you would not take. I think they'll have taken it. If it is, if it is, and we don't know that it is, they'll have taken his wallet, they'll have taken whatever cash, if any, were in. I think young people these days, though, they don't really carry cash. Now, his clothes will have been useful uh, if you're a homeless person, if you do, or if they were like a designer label. But, you know, nobody's going to be able to sell them on now. You know, everybody knows about Riley, so who's going to be able, who's going to buy them? You know, as soon as someone's offering you a pair of jeans for the, well, maybe not everybody knows about Riley. I suppose we have to remember that as well. But you just feel that if somebody offers you a pair of designer jeans um, that are like built for a six foot seven uh, tall individual, surely antenna would turn up because they're not common, are they? They're not common. That's it. They're selling just normal, your average jeans, whether they're designer or not, but average size. But these are notable. Present. Um, and especially you have to take into consideration the location that oh, you were hey, missing. Hey, 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 hold on. Before I lose the thought, before I lose the thought, Ben Powers, I'm going to follow up with Joe Scott Morgan about the pants missing. But as you pointed out twice, and I'm glad you did because it sparked a thought. Um, if the current had somehow dragged his pants off, why not the boxers too? If the current was that strong, I don't know that I've ever seen a drowning case where it literally pulled your clothes off. Uh, hold on just one moment. I want to go to Dryden Quigley joining us, investigative reporter, WSMV4. But first, let's get some more knowledge before we reach a conclusion. Take a listen to more of the 911 call. What else do we learn about the discovery of Riley's body. Listen. And you said you guys found a dead body? Yes, ma'am, in the river. We are no barges at this facility. And I was like? checking around my dock. Yeah, that was a funny question, Jess, wasn't it? What does it look like? What do you mean, what does it look like? He's just said that he thinks it's Riley, unless she hadn't heard that and she's thinking, is it Riley or what? Why would she ask what it looked like? Well, not very good, I would imagine. Strange question. Uh, it's definitely got a person hair, black shirt, kind of like a white, muddy looking on the front. It's face it's down in the water. Shirt. Yes, ma'am. It's, it's a, Caucasian. It looks like a male. Yes, ma'am. I, I want to hear more of that 911 call because I'm learning a lot of facts. Listen. Is he completely submerged or is he right on that, like, the, the bed? Not the bed, but, like, is he partially in the water, partially out of the water? No. He's, he's fully submerged the size of his uh, back sticking out of the water. I actually had to move a log off of, his, off of the head to confirm it was a body. Okay. I have this call up, and I'm going to get somebody out there, okay? No, all right. I'll, uh, I'll meet them up top. I'm going to make my way up from the river in just a few minutes. Okay. All right. I'll let you go. All right. Thank you. Uh-huh. I'm very intrigued, and I want to know if everybody else has noticed this as well. I don't know if you noticed as well. So this poor guy who's rung at the end, he goes, oh, that, he was so polite, wasn't he? So nice. Thank you, he said. She never even said thank you for ringing in. She just went, he said, oh, okay, thank you. And she just went, eh. oh, God, what an awful, you know, what is wrong with these people? Just say, you know, thank you for ringing in. You know, a concerned citizen ringing in. He's going to um, put a stop to a family's sort of worrying about where their uh, child is. And he's like, uh, she's just like, mm -hmm. Well, let me just throw it out to Joe Scott Morgan. This has nothing to do with the body, but you and I have listened to a lot of 911 calls, as I'm sure you have too, Ben Powers in court. Why did the 911 dispatchers always like, what? Huh? It's a dead body. They're like not even worried. <laughs> Does anybody notice that beside me? No? Yes? Then anybody? No, I mean, when, when you hear her responses, Nancy, you have to understand she's got other calls that have been coming in, all right? 
this this is not separated from her. She has to survive in the environment that she oh, is, and she has to remain. No, no. Uh, I, mean... <laughs> I love the way she just gets so angry about it because I understand what you're saying. And you know what, that woman, maybe she was right on the end of her shift. She might have had five minutes to go and all she's thinking about now is what she's going to have for her dinner when she gets home. You know, she's going out later for a meal or she's going to meet a boyfriend or whatever. She may have massive problems in her own life. She might be ill. She might have family that are ill. She's probably got a million things going on. Also, she's got phone call after phone call, which at the end of the day, if you're a, disp a 911 operator, you're not going to get cheerful phone calls, are you? The phone calls you're going to get are going to be about people, you know, having a heart attack or finding a body or murder, you know, people shooting or aggressive neighbours. So I do understand it. But the thing is, you know, it's like everything else. You don't like that job, don't do it. You know, that would be my recommendation to anybody. It's like on YouTube, you know, sometimes I get some really nasty things said to me. Well, I have to always make a decision whether do I want to do YouTube or not. Now, I don't obviously get it with the Spanish classes you know, most of the time. Occasionally you get a strange sort of type person, but very, very rare. But, you know, at the end of the day, if I want to do have a YouTube channel, I do have to take the good with the bad. And luckily for me, the bad is, you know, tiny and the good is massive. You know, as far as comments, etc., are concerned. And sometimes they're not even really bad comments, just people thinking they can advise you on how to run your channel for the best will in the world. <laughs> but, you know, there are people that don't run a YouTube channel. So, you know, it, it's sort of like, anyway, you get all sorts of things. So, what I'm trying to say is, if I, I there's no point in me whinging about that because then I shouldn't, you know, I have a choice. I don't have to do a YouTube channel. That woman does not necessarily have to work for, as a first responder. So if it, I, I do think once you get to a point, and I'm sure that happens, you know, and it's understandable and human that after you've been doing it for a while and you've had call after call and you do get a bit cynical, a bit jaded and all those things. But so often I've listened to these 911 calls and you just think, oh, my God. Because for the person who's ringing, it's not their 500th call. They've never rang probably 911 ever before. And they've certainly never found a dead body in the river before. So, you know, the, <laughs> he's ending up saying thanks to her, but she should have been thanking him for being a public citizen and phoning up in a compassionate way, worrying that this might be Riley. Um, so something, you know, they need to perhaps look at that a little bit. It's like if you work in a pub. If you work in a pub, if you're a landlord, a landlady, you do have to be happy all the time as far as the public face is concerned because people go to the pub to forget the problems. They don't want to go to the pub, <laughs> look at your miserable face. They could do that at home, sit and look at their partner's miserable face or sit and listen to their kids whinging or, you know, people do things, uh, not only going to a pub, but, you know, going on holiday or there are certain jobs where that is your job. That's your professionality. You know, it's like if you're an air hostess. I mean, all right, you don't have to, or uh, an air steward, as they call them these days, you could be a man or a woman. You don't have to put up with, don't get wrong, I don't feel that you have to put up with people being horrible to you. No, I don't agree with that. But it's, you do have to, you know, people are going on holiday, you are going to get twonked sometimes. And as long as they don't go too far, you have got to put up with so much. Um, just, <laughs> but do you understand what I'm saying? Or it's like, if you, it, it'd be like being a grave digger and complaining that you had too much digging to do or being, um, uh, uh, let me think, a nurse and, and saying, oh, I don't like all the blood. You know, if that's your job, that's your job. And if you don't like that job, that's fine too, because it's not for everyone. Get another job. But don't make it difficult for people ringing in. Uh, of course. You know. Oh, there's a fire hydrant running on uh, Main Street. Oh, I see a car accident. <laughs> they look hey. they've heard their neck. Okay, you know no, what? That, that's what you've got for me. 
All right. This this is not separated from her. She has to survive in the environment that she oh, in, and she has to remain. No, no. I Other mean, calls. You know. Oh, there's a fire hydrant running on uh, Main Street. Ooh, I see a car accident. <laughs> they look like they've hurt their neck. Okay, you know no, what? That, that's what you've got for me. She's taking. No, other I've, I've got more. She can't I've really got get more invested. Here. No, I she's she's in doing things like domestic violence calls, those sorts of things. Maybe armed robberies. <laughs> talking about anything. Nashville's a big town, dancer. and so she has to deal with a lot of things. She cannot have her voice going up and down in these sorts of things. She has to maintain calm during the midst of it. Well, I agree that she has to maintain calm. I agree that she can't go, oh my God, you found a body. I'm not saying that. She, <laughs> she's not got to be saying that. But at the end of the day, she has maybe got to be a little bit more interested. Okay, you can call it calm. Some people might call it disinterested, but I'm going to go with what you said. Nashville is a big town. There's a lot of crime. So, uh, she is not my concern right now, too. Dryden Quigley joining us, investigative reporter, WSMV4. Dryden, tell me, first of all, thank you for being with us. Tell me about the discovery of Riley's body because it's not adding up for me. Yeah, I mean, it was the second call of the dead body we got that week. So at first, I think a lot of us were like, is it going to be him? Is it not going to be him? So when we got this call that they found a body in the river, a lot of us. Oh, yeah, because remember, there had been a body found already, hadn't there? So this was the second body they'd found while they they were searching rushed out there you know to see what was going on if it would be identified as him um, which it was Brian quickly you raced to the scene when you heard about the 911 call a how did you hear about it and b what did you see or hear or sense when you arrived so i myself wasn't on the scene we had sent another reporter there first but i know that when he got there there were a ton of police officers there they weren't able to go exactly towards the water but you know, they had a lot of officers. I think the feeling was that, you know, it was going to be Riley this time. Just want to reiterate um, how thankful we are for everyone and how much we appreciate it. So this is Riley's mom, Michelle, and notice they're all wearing green again. Everyone's support and love and prayers because we feel them. We have felt every one of them, every single one. I just ask that you mamas out there hug your babies tight tonight, please. Please, for me, just hug your babies Aww. tight tonight. And again, thank you. Thank you for sharing our story. I don't know how Riley's mom, Michelle, even had the strength to stand up in front of microphones and speak to the public as articulately as she did bringing home not only has she lost her son but now that he's been found so many questions uh, uh, you know what let's hear part of that 911 one more time uh, there's something very significant there i want to analyze is he completely submerged or is he right on that like the, the bed not the bed but like is he partially in the water partially out of the water no He's, he's fully submerged besides his, his uh, back sticking out of the water. I actually had to move a log off of his off of the head to confirm it was a body. Okay. I have this call up and I'm going to get somebody out there, okay? No, all right. I'll, uh, I'll meet them up top. I'm going to make my way up on the river. Okay. All right. I'll let you go. All right. Thank you. Uh-huh. Yeah, when she, when he says thank you, she goes, uh-huh. But she does come, seem to get a little bit more interested towards the end of the call. Chris Dingman is with us, uh, a very dear family friend and spokesperson for Riley Strain's family. They have a GoFundMe, Aunt Riley Strain. Chris, the details that we're hearing, that his head was lodged under a log, that his boots, wallet, pants missing, but especially hearing on the 911 call that his head was lodged under a log are those facts that the mom michelle knows uh, is she 
it, it would break my heart to hear those facts. I don't know that she's ready to hear that. It is awful to think of him being lodged under a log, isn't it? Especially as well. Um, anyway. But you know what? At the same time, you would want to know all the details. We actually, as a, a collective group in Riley's War Room, kept a lot of stuff from Michelle. Just because as you deal on a daily basis and a lot of people on the panel today, it's a dark world out there and people like to do cruel things. So... I, I am unaware at this moment. I don't think Michelle knew the, the graphic nature of how Riley was found. Uh, the war room, the dads, the uncles, etc. Yes, we were quite aware of it. And uh, the, the wild part is Ryan, uh, Riley's dad, actually was at that location. And they pinged it that night at like 11 or 12 o'clock that night in the boat uh, as a possible location to search with the dogs. Uh, I do know that. To Karen Stark joining us now, uh, high-profile TV radio trauma expert and consultant at KarenStark.com. If you're looking for her, that's Karen with a C. Karen, thank you for being with us. Um, it's bad enough when the one you love, you lose them. They die. But then you find out about a traumatic death. And as you and I have discussed many times about Keith, you think, oh, did they feel what happened? Did they know what was happening to them? What My point is, did they suffer? What was that like? Uh, and then you find out it could have been wrongdoing on someone else's part, such as a murder. It's overwhelming. I, I don't know how, and, you know, Karen, I thought I knew it all when my fiance was killed, but now that I have the twins, I don't I can't even imagine what Michelle is going through. And now this and the confusion about what really happened to Riley. I mean, I'd rather know. Look, he was rolled by some homeless people. We don't know who yet. But his pants didn't just float off in the water. That's not what happened. And I don't believe they or the or, or other items have been recovered yet, which you would think naturally they would follow the current where the body went, right? Well, they haven't. So where are they? What happened? So without knowing the truth, you're kind of left in some horrible purgatory, some limbo where you don't know what happened to them. Nancy, if you think about what happened with you with Keith, right, the more details that you're able to have, even though it's horrific, it's just you want to know. You want to know exactly what happened because your imagination just keeps going. It's not like you could let it go. This is traumatic. Your child is dead before. Yeah, I agree. As far as I'm concerned, for, for me and my personality, maybe everyone's different. But I would want to know everything, everything, no matter how upsetting it was, I would want to know every single detail of what happened to my boy, uh, you know, and then I would be asking all the questions that they are asking, because you want the truth, you want the truth, of course you do. This makes it, listen to this case now and thinking about it, it does make it all the more strange of other cases that we've looked at where they don't want to know. But, you know, I suppose everybody's different. And there's all different reasons because every case is different. This is different, uh, I suppose, from other cases. For yeah. you. It's not the way it's supposed to go in the world. And so here you are with this situation and you're told that his pants are off. Well, they say that you can't take pants off if you're in the water. He couldn't do it himself. His boots were off. They found the cards. So the more details that are confusing that he died by drowning, but no, maybe not, the harder it is. And they need to have the beginning. Look, they will never heal from this. You know that more than anyone. But the beginning of some kind of process to make them be able to live with this, they're not having that right now. The body of Riley Strain was found submerged under a log in the Cumberland River eight miles down river from where he was last seen. Strain still had on the white and black shirt he was last seen wearing, but his boots, pants, and wallet were missing. 
Officials say it's not uncommon for clothing to come off drowning victims in the water. The initial autopsy report says no sign of foul play, but the family has ordered a second private autopsy, saying no water in his lungs raises questions about drowning. The claim that the coroner noted a lack of water in Strain's lungs has not been publicly confirmed. Joining me in all-star panel, but first I want to go to Joe Scott Morgan, professor of forensic Jacksonville State University and death investigator. He has investigated over 1,000 deaths. Joe Scott, again, thank you for being with us. This is a lot of information to digest, and I want to hear your analysis, especially about no water being in the lungs in a drowning case. Listen, you're not always going to find water in the lungs, Nancy, in a drowning. You can have what's referred to as a drought, uh, dry drowning uh, many times. Uh, this is where you have actually a spasm that occurs in the organs of the, of the throat. You can prevent water from getting in. But, you know, here, here's the problem with this. There's other locations you look to see if there are, in fact, evidences of drowning with a body. And my the biggest problem I have with this, Nancy, is that they have not had sufficient amount of time to do all of the testing, including toxicology, that they need to come back to. This is an incomplete investigation as far as I'm concerned. Hold on, hold on. I, 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 everything you, you're saying. So that's interesting. What you're saying, that is it in his opinion, it's an incomplete investigation so far. It's extremely valuable. I'm trying to write as fast as I can. Yeah. Okay. Dry drowning. Dry drowning. You want yes. me to accept that? Uh, it, you know, whether or not you want to accept it or not, it's the reality is, is that it does occur. So you can't. How often have, have you seen it happen? Uh, I'd, I'd say probably at least a dozen times over the course of my career. Uh, worked a long time. What were in the New circumstances? Orleans. Now, but. <laughs> She's cross-examining him. And this is what I mean. It is, she's brilliant, really, because she doesn't let... Look at his face. She doesn't let anyone get anyone, even her experts that she's brought on the programme. She doesn't let the, them get away with just making throwaway comments. So she's saying, how many times have you seen it happen? And he says, about a dozen times. And you'll see in a minute, he goes on to say... Um, He's done 4, 000, over 4,000, you know, he's seen over 4,000 cases. So out of those 4,000, he's seen dry drowning in around 12 cases. And she tries to qualify him on that as well. What do you mean around, you know, like shit? And now she's asking him, what were the circumstances? So when and he's, uh, he's forced to admit, you can tell by his face there, he's not convinced of what he's saying, but he's forced to admit um, that it's normally in cases of blunt force trauma, but also in cases of extreme intoxication. Let's see what she goes on to say. Uh, you have individuals that go into the water, particularly in an inebriated state. Uh, this can particularly happen sometimes. Uh, and you can have individuals that have sustained, have sustained trauma uh, where this occurs as well. Uh, and generally, there's going to be some kind of neurological compromise when that happens. I, I'm, I'm very curious. I don't as know to what, what that means, neurological well, compromise. Well, that means that they have sustained a head trauma, perhaps. And I would but be he, he very, how do we know? Because How do we know it that wasn't he didn't? Reported in it the wasn't autopsy. reported. All right. Yeah. Well. Uh, yeah. And they haven't reported toxicology yet either. I, I think that it's very important pause, that they have pause. done a second autopsy. Apples, oranges. See, Joe Scott, I, I know your your game really well. When you throw things on me like neurological, what did you say? Neurological what? Compromise. Is that what you said? Mm -hmm. Neurological compromise. Okay. Yes. You're throwing words at me as a medical examiner, as a death investigator, mm -hmm. that a lawyer wouldn't necessarily know what that meant. But guess what? I do know what that means mm -hmm. for once. So let me just say, um, then you said, when I said, well, there was no report of a blow to the head or any contusion, any hemorrhage bruising to the head, you went, oh, well, there's not toxicology either. Apples, oranges. Because... You can look at the body and see if there's a blow to the head. 
Easy. You can't look at the body and know about toxicology. You have to wait until those blood tests or tissue tests come back. So if they're telling, if they're not noting in the autopsy that there's a blow to the head, then there's not a blow to the head. That's not something you have to wait on. Right. You're absolutely right. And so I think that other things that they need to be digging into here, Nancy, are something where that we look for in drowning, which are referred to as diatome testing, which are these little... Now, this is something that for those of us that have followed the Nicola Bully case, a lot of people asked about the diatoms. I don't think that's ever really been answered, has it, about the diatoms? If anybody does think it has or knows, let me know. But as far as I'm concerned, I don't know anything about diatoms. I don't understand all these things anyway. But uh, he goes into this in some detail, which is very interesting. Algae creatures that exist in water. Uh, that has not been released as well. I don't know if they're doing diatom uh, testing there. Also, any kind of barotrauma, and what we look for is water in the inner ear. Many times this happens when bodies have been, uh, say, submerged at great depth. Uh, and, yeah, we get water in our ears when we swim. However, this is something, this is deep within the ear. And many times this happens as a result of forced pressure. Uh, I'm, I'm interested to try to understand why in the hell they have released this information so prematurely when they have don't have a complete investigation done at this point in time. I'm still waiting. I'm trying to decipher everything you said. Dry drowning. And you said that... Do you think that's interesting, what you said about the ears? Because, of course, we, we know just from swimming, we get water in our ears, don't we? So the water that you've got in your ears would be very, uh, the amount of water, how far down your ear it's gone, uh, the diatoms, all these things that uh, are important. But he seems to be concerned that they released the, well, they did an autopsy right by the side of the river. Uh, they have done, they did do another one afterwards. and But yeah, maybe they have been too quick in releasing results. Maybe they felt under pressure because of the um, prominence of this case. That you, Joe Scott Morgan, have encountered dry drowning about 12 times. Isn't that what you said? That's correct. Do you think it's 12 or could it have been less? No, I'd say it's probably around 12, yeah. Around 12, okay. And Joe Scott Morgan, around how many death investigations have you conducted? I don't know, Nancy, probably uh, upwards of, I don't know, uh, 4,000, I would imagine. So 4,000 mm -hmm. around, just like around 12. Now it's around 4,000. So you can tell she's been like a lawyer, can't you, a prosecution lawyer. She's very good because she doesn't let even her own guests, she doesn't let them get away with it. So basically she's done around 4,000 uh, autopsies and around 12 of them have been dry drowning now come on that's not a massive percentage is it uh i god i don't know how to work out percentages but even i know but let's have a look see if i can maybe google will tell me Oh, come on, it's not coming up with anything. Pew taxing 4,000 divided by 12. Let's have a look. Show me. Sorry, I'm, I'm quite um, keen on this because 12 is what percentage? So. What is percentage of, oh God, can't even understand how you put it in. And I don't have a calculator, so yeah, I might have to call it up. But there'll be some of you out there, I know, who will know exactly how to do that. If any of you know what percentage, let me think for that. Well, 
It's small anyway, isn't it? But please so let me out know. Out of 4,000 death investigations, mm -hmm. you've had around 12 dry drownings. Is that mm -hmm. correct? Correct. <laughs> and in those cases, did you say that often you found a neurological compromise, plain language, regular people talk, blow to the head? It does occur, yes. Did it occur in those 12? To the best of my recollection, every single time they were compromised in some way, either from a head strike or from being inebriated. Somebody I know is going into cross-examination mode, and that would be you. Because when somebody throws out, to the best of my recollection, that means I may be right or I may be wrong, but I'm going to CYA. CYA. You're telling me oh. out of 4,000 cases, you've had about 12 dry drownings. And in those 12 dry drownings, they had, as you say, neurological compromise, i.e., blood of the head. Yes, no. Yes. Okay, got it. So in this case, since we don't know about a blood of the head, that differentiates itself from all of your dry drownings. Okay. Um, now that we have ferreted that out, Joe Scott, please just tell me what you think in regular people talk. No neurological compromise, no blow to the head, extrinsic evidence. Doesn't have his pants on. Boots would have just dragged him down to the bottom. His debit card is up near that homeless camp. I don't. I don't understand. His I don't. I don't gone. understand what, what dragging him down to the bottom has to do with the condition in which his body was found and where he was found. It is possible for boots to come off. I have a real problem with pants coming off, though. I also don't know if his pants were belted as well. That has not been addressed at all. Uh, and here's another thing: those clothes would have had to have come off early on, Nancy. Well, it has been now, hasn't it? Because the family have said. He wore a belt every day with his jeans. So they would have been belted. Because as the body is in this in the Cumberland for this protracted period of time, I think we're looking at what a two week period. Uh, forgive me for saying this, but the body will become bloated during that potential uh, particular bit of time. That means that with the bloating comes tension. And so the body begins to swell. So the probability of the pants coming off as he's been in there for a protracted period of time, would not have happened at the end or prior to the discovery. It would have had to have happened prior to, all right? Yeah. So this uh, thing that the body, you know, uh, as he says, we don't want to be too graphic, but uh, bodies in water t do tend to bloat as time goes on. So if his jeans did come off, it would have been early on, not later on, after his body bloated. Bless him. Bless him. Bless Riley. So I think that that's something else that needs to be factored in as well. Okay. That is the Joe Scott Morgan you're hearing right there. That is the renowned professor at Jacksonville State University and the author of Blood Beneath My Feet and the star of Body Bags with Joe Scott Morgan. Everything you just said is brilliant. I, I didn't even take notes because I wanted to drink it in what you just said. The one thing, I did manage to write down two words. I didn't want to miss anything. And what you just said is critical. Were those pants belted? And you said you guys found a dead body? Yes, ma'am, in the river. We are no barges at this facility. What does it look I was like? checking around my dock. Uh, it's definitely got a person hair, black shirt, kind of like a white, muddy looking on the front. It's face it's down in the water. Shirt. Yes, ma'am. It's, it's a Caucasian. It looks like a male. Yes, ma'am. The suggestion that this young man died of a dry drowning doesn't make any sense compared with no. the extrinsic evidence that we have learned. Uh, to Dryden Quigley joining us, WSMV4 there in Tennessee, explain to me where the body was found in relation to 
all the other points of interest, specifically that homeless encampment. Yeah, so that's right where he went into the water. So you're walking along this kind of the, the road on your right side is going to be this steep, steep slope into the river. There's no way that he was walking down towards that river. Um, but there are some homeless camps, you know, kind of perched along it, but it's very wooded down there. So if he, he would have had to fall or, yes, been pushed over kind of the edge into that water. And now, see the rugged terrain. So to, he wouldn't have been able to walk down to the water. He would have had to fall in. Uh, somebody, even JLR said that he went down and he found it difficult uh, to go down and look into that, in, you know, to actually go down. So those TikTokers did really well to find the card, the debit card, uh, because it's not easy, as you can see, to search there. Now, makes you think that Riley must have either fell in or been pushed in, one or the other. He's not just, uh, you know... <sighs> Now, some people have suggested he might have been relieving himself. And the family friend on here himself, he admits that Riley's very uh, shy, let's say, you know. So, you know, whereas, you know what men are like, sorry men out there, but I know for a fact some men don't care. Uh, they just go and have a wee anywhere, especially here in Spain. Believe me, they just pee anywhere in front of anyone. Uh, and then other men uh, are very shy, you know, and he'd be looking for a private place, even in his drunken state, if he needed to relieve himself. And then maybe he missed the, you know, you can see that it'd be easy, wouldn't it, to think maybe he thought that he could just walk down there and he couldn't. You know, he's took a step there and he's just gone careering down the bank. You know, that's possible. But then, of course, you'd think he would have some abrasions on his body but would they have been washed away after two weeks in the water you know only forensic uh, scientists know that or had he been pushed was he pushed over you know uh, that's a possibility too so he wasn't walking right although he was walking along the river he was not walking right along the river this is not like saint michael's even saint michael's there was a uh, you know, uh, uh, a big gap and it was unlikely that someone could just fall in without being pushed in or jumping in. Um, but, you know, it's uh, one of those things, you know, it's like, um, did he fall, did he jump or was he pushed? But somehow he ended up in there, maybe just literally... This is the trouble when you don't maybe just literally took a step, thought there was uh, land there, and it ended up it wasn't. And then his body was found a few miles down the river from, from where he supposedly went in, or where he was last seen on camera. Chris Dingman joining us, the family spokesperson and very dear friend of Riley's family. Chris, what does all of this mean to you and the family? Uh, it, it's once again, we have way more questions than answers. And to answer uh, one of the panelists, uh, I did confer with the family last night, much like my son is the same height as Riley, and you've seen the pictures of him. The boys wear belts uh, because they have swimmers' bodies, in essence. And, uh, you know, there's very, very, very good chance Riley did have a belt on that evening. Uh, where the location it went in, uh, I'll be honest with you, I'm a very avid outdoors guy, and uh, it's extreme terrain at the homeless camp area, let alone the sheer drop-off area where the credit card was found, the debit card. Uh, more confusing questions from the police officer's body cam. If you timestamp it to where the detention mm -hmm. center picks back up where Riley is no longer seen in any video. I just want to say as well, you can see the flow to that river. That's a big river and it's flowing. So you can see that Riley's body could easily have been taken away uh, by the current. I mean, I can't see that he died of that uh, cold water shock because I think it was quite warm, wasn't it? But um, did he just fall in the water and because of his state he couldn't? Was he, was he already deceased when he went in the water? Or was he not? But did he? Thing is, if he struggled for his, if he struggled not to drown in the water, he would have water in his lungs. 
if he fell into the water and he was alive, he would have water in his lungs, surely, because he would be gulping in the water if nothing else. Uh, okay, maybe if he was inebriated, what, what they're saying, he was unconscious, but surely he would have taken at least a few gulps, you know, to try and... You know, I, I can't believe that dry drowning thing. I don't believe it. So he could have been dead when he went in the water or he could have been unconscious when he went in the water. Those, there's numerous, numerous people on little scooters. Uh, they're also walking. That's in that time era that, you know, somebody, it wasn't like it was a, you know, three o'clock in the morning, everybody went home. There are people, cars driving by. Uh, we even had one of the gentlemen say that I saw two Teslas setting in the police cam footage for the body cam. You know, they run video 24-7. I still personally think that uh, somebody knows something, you know, whether it was a homeless person, a person visiting from out of town, uh, who. I think there was too many people that was in that area uh, for it just to go unnoticed. That's my personal opinion. I agree. Too many people. There was a lot of people around. There were scooters going past. There were police or security guards there. Nobody heard a splash. Nobody heard anything odd. Agree. Just got Morgan. Why was it so significant to you to find out whether Riley was wearing a belt? And now that we believe we have the answer from Chris Dingman that he was, what, if anything, does that mean to you, Joe Scott? It means, Nancy, that it would be much more, it, it's more plausible, I think, or potential. The potential exists, uh, as Dr. Bass has said, I think, previously, that uh, the pants may have come off. They could, but if they were belted, it would be a much tougher hill to climb, that the water would just simply pull them off. Because, as was mentioned, this young gentleman is tall and slender. Those pants are not going to stay up. He has to have them belted. And again, when you combine all of these things, I worked a lot of cases, Nancy, where people's shoes do in fact come off in the water. The current generally facilitates that. But when you have pants that come off, that's a completely different animal at that point in time. That's what, you know, uh, leaves me with more questions and answers here. Dry drowning is also known. Yeah, also, supposing the jeans would have come off in the water, wouldn't they have been found? Wouldn't the boots have been found? Boots tend to float. Shoes float. Quite often, that's the only thing that floats up on beaches, isn't it? Shoes. Uh, you know, from people that have gone into the sea or whatever. Quite often, their shoes turn up. Sometimes, very gruesomely, they've got, like, um, the feet in them, you know, because if the, you know, the bodies, oh gosh, it's horrible to think about. I'm talking about people who've been in the sea for years, for ages. Sometimes the the the, the bones then will sort of dislocate, like uh, separate. So, and then because shoes flow, a, a shoe will turn up on a beach. So maybe it's too early, maybe it's too early for that to happen now, but if, if Riley's boots and jeans are out there somewhere, they will be found, surely. And as Lorenzo spasm, uh, as Joe Scott was saying earlier, how your uh, larynx will spasm. But would that spasm last long enough? If it unspasmed, would he ingest water? And if you drown... I thought the reason you drown is because your lungs are full of water. So how can you drown without your lungs being full of water? Uh, you can drown uh, without the water present in your lungs because if you'll just think about, which we cover a lot of these cases, Nancy, asphyxial deaths, you're essentially depriving your brain of oxygen. And so that's going to be compromised. If he has any substances on board, that's also going to be another compromising position. But as I'd mentioned just a moment ago, and I think that this is important for them to explore, he would still take on enough water. If it could get into the peripheral system, it, that means out into his organs, into his bloodstream, and even in, yes, to his bone marrow, where you're searching for diatoms. 
we take samples of these little air, of these areas of the body and you do an acid, what's referred to as an acid test on these areas. And you look for these little creatures that only exist in water. This is so interesting what this guy is saying. Born environments and they kind of spread out. We, we do this in, te in, in drowning cases uh, with great frequency. And so I'd be curious if they took the time to do that. And that's only something that happens in the anti-mortem state, Nancy. That means it doesn't happen post-mortem. You have to take these on and they have to be shunted off into the peripheral system at that point in time. So I'm still waiting on that, just like we're waiting on toxicology. Chris Dingman, you inferred that people have been embedded into the homeless community to get information. Did they get any information? Um, uh, we, we've got a lot of information. That That's interesting as well, what she said, that people have been embedded into the homeless community to try and get information. So I'll take it, pretending the homeless to try and sort of, I don't know, or, or, or going around interviewing homeless people. It's very difficult with homeless people because they won't want to be brought to the, maybe some of them have got some, you know, issues with the police or whatever. They won't want to be brought to the police's attention. But this is going back to what I was saying when I was in Madrid, talking to people about the Anna Knezovic case. Uh, that's why where citizen sleuths, if you like, can come in very handy because people quite often will talk to people who are not police. You know, they don't want to talk to the police. People don't want to get involved with the police. They don't want to get brought into things, to get involved in things, you know, especially if it's not their own uh, family or friend. So they're concerned and they, you know, they were always concerned, but they don't want to, you know, if you said to them, oh, well, will you come to the police station and make a statement? They won't want to do that. They don't mind talking to you about it. Uh, and giving you information, you can get people on your side, and you know, but they don't want to talk to the authorities. And some people may be immigrants, and maybe they're illegally and don't want to, you know, that's what I think is a case with the Rachel Marin case. You know, why this twonk still hasn't been caught yet, where they've got his DNA, they've got a photo fit of him that's as clear as day. Uh, somebody knows who this guy is, 100%. But nobody wants to talk because they they may well be in America illegally. So they don't want to talk because they don't want attention brought to them. Uh, so this is interesting. So if you, I mean, how you would get a homeless person to talk, you've got to be careful because you can offer money, of course, food. But then you've got to be careful then of attracting people who just want the money. So they'll say anything because like, oh, yeah, I want that $20. Uh, and they say, oh, yeah, I saw him. You know, you get false alibi, uh, false testimony as well. So it's a whole sort of hornet's nest, isn't it? But it's interesting to, to hear him say that they've been doing that. And we're still processing through. Unfortunately, when all this went down and due to the media impact in that area, the homeless scattered. 90% uh, of them do not want to be in the limelight or talk to people, etc. Yeah. We do have, personally, uh, I don't think, Metro Nashville following up on it, but we do have personally some people that we are still trying to track down at other camps just for information. If this truly was an accident, uh, you know, Michelle has her son home and they're going to get to have a proper burial, which was big, big for me on the side of the family. I, I did not want to have to bring Michelle home without her son, uh, good or bad. Uh, but Michelle does have that. But now, now we're able to actually dig into some of the stuff that we have questions on. The priority was getting Michelle, her son, and Ryan and Chris uh, to get them home back in a, in a controlled environment with loved friends and family and everybody. But now the dad's in the war room. We, we need some answers. You know, we've got questions just like on the panel today. We, we've given each other information and we thought we had an angle and all of a sudden now we have 100 more angles. Uh, but no, there's people of interest that we personally uh, are trying to reach out to, not because we think there was... Oh. malcontent in it but somebody and you know somebody knows something there's just too many people in that area one of the theories was that right maybe riley had went around the corner tried to relieve himself uh the young lady from nashville doing the reporting with us in the group she can verify that terrain is extreme terrain right there and riley 
of all my boys, even though he's not mine, all my boys, he was the modest one. Uh, you know, he, he was not a go out in public kind of, kind of guy like we were raised on the country. So that was nothing that ever crossed my mind. And also one more question. In other words, what he means is he doesn't mind peeing in public, but he knew Riley wouldn't. That's so sweet, isn't it? And it is true. You know, and you know, if you, with your kids or with your kids' friends, and that there's always those that have got no, you know, don't care, who just go off and you know have a pee anywhere. Men or women, boys or girls, and then others are really self conscious and stuff. And of course, here in Spain, it's honest to God, it, it literally you see it all the time. People peeing in doorways, men, of course, not women normally. Uh, it just seems to be accepted as being okay. And it was a real shock to me the first time I saw it. Literally saw a guy uh, would come out of a bar and he's just gone off behind a car and, and done a pee in the street. Why well, didn't have a pee in the toilet? I don't know. But Riley, from what uh, his uh, godfather, or his, uh, the spokesperson for the family, is saying, he was a bit shy than that. He probably would have gone, tried to go somewhere uh secluded and that may you know have been dangerous for him so it's a possibility uh and the thing is that uh, again and i've said it a few times throughout this video we're coming to the end of it it's been a long video but um it's not that the family are saying there definitely is foul play what the family are saying is they want there are a lot of questions that they want answering and one, once those questions are answered they can sleep easier knowing what has or hasn't happened to Riley. But the thought that maybe some foul play did happen to Riley and somebody out there has got away with it or is walking around with his boots on or his jeans on, oh, my God, you know, you'd be walking around that area looking for that. Uh, you know, you could not rest. So this is the point. It's not necessarily that there was foul play it's that let's have these questions answered so this family can rest a bit easier at night uh everybody's talking about the boots i have to I have to let everybody know those are a size 15. and if you've ever had wet boots on or wet shoes they're extremely tough to get off that young man uh, had a size 15 shoe on so boot on so a lot of questions we're trying to get answers unfortunately we can do that at this moment because riley is home uh but we need the help. We need the help of the public. Uh, that seems to be where we've gotten our answers as a family. And uh, I think there's still more answers out there. A dry drowning, no water in his lungs with no blow to the head. When does that ever happen? Practically never. What happened to Riley Strain? To you, Ben Powers, high profile lawyer in that jurisdiction, weigh in. So for me, the thing that stands out is the commonality of the things they're missing, the boots, the pants, and the debit card that's discarded. Those are all things that are valuable to the encampment where he went missing. The debit card may have been discarded because you have to go use it. And to use it, you have to go be on camera using it. And so it's too much risk. Potentially, it doesn't have intrinsic value like the pants and the boots that are missing. I think that in combination with all the other evidence we've discussed, certainly raises a lot of questions that we don't have answers to today. You're right, Ben Powers. Those boots have not been found, and I'd like to know whether anybody's wearing those boots as we're talking right now. Yep. To Karen Stark, psychologist. Karen? I'll tell you, Nancy, they will never get over this. You know that. She's talking about holding babies close. But the more answers that they have, the better mm -hmm. it is for the family, despite the grief. If you know or think you know anything regarding the death of this son, this beloved son, Riley Strain, please dial 615-862-8600. But right now, let's pause to remember American hero, Officer Jonah Hernandez, just 35 years old, Las Cruces, New Mexico, loved helping those in need lifelong dream of becoming an officer leaves behind wife Yesenia and two beautiful young sons. Oh. Jonah Hernandez, American hero. I'll see you tomorrow night.
6 and 9 p.m. sharp Eastern. And until then, good night, friend. Oh, I don't know. I've got emotional talk, thinking about that. Are they? So obviously some, it looks like some uh, policeman has been killed in the line of duty, which is very sad. Okay. So, wow. So that was a bit of a marathon, the video. Um, there's a lot there to think about. I mean, I'm going to show this tonight in a premiere. Uh, get your provisions in. Well, you, you, I'll tell you that when I uh, put up the um, put up the notification. I will also tomorrow uh, cut it into more bite-sized pieces because you know this video now we're on nearly three hours, and I know a lot of people don't like. Some people love a long video. I know that, and other people don't. So tomorrow I will be chopping this up into bite-sized pieces and releasing it as three separate videos uh, just so that it's not so long for the people who don't like it long but do try I do try and please everyone all the time but sometimes you know I can't and uh, sometimes I just have to do what's right for my channel but thank you all of you for all your positive comments any positive comment you give I'm so grateful for thank you for subscribing thank you for liking let's Look Look at the CCTV. Anything you see that hasn't been mentioned in what I've talked about tonight, you know, I appreciate everyone who sent me uh, information about, you know, vital points in that video because that literally is not my strong point. Uh, even if I had the time to sit and do it, I'm not brilliant at it. So thank you for that. And um, whatever the truth is, Let's hope that Riley Strain's family get answers. It cannot bring Riley back. Riley's not coming back. It's a very sad loss. But Riley hopefully is in it, the next world and Riley will be in the next world welcomed. You know, like uh, I doubt very much if he's got any penance to do. He just comes over as such a lovely sunny person and is a big loss uh, to his friends to his family to the world and to what he could have brought to the world because he was just embarking on his life and it seems like riley would have made a positive difference to this world and we need people like that don't we uh now i don't want you to think that everybody in this world is a uh, negative influence because i don't believe that either I think there's a lot of uh, people like Riley in this world and sometimes maybe when we look at true crime, we forget that uh, most people are nice, you know. So probably for every million people you get that are nice, you get one twonk, but unfortunately do remember the twonk most of the time. Anyway, so as always, I will see you really soon in the next video. And until then, as always... May your God go with you. Bye.